I already called them. No, it's okay. It's okay. Stay where you are. Never mind. Doesn't matter. Um, just stay where you are. Fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But the, the screen will look smaller because I have to have the chat thing open up. I already called the, the estate already regarding... Oh, I didn't record. I already called the estate regarding um, the aircon. But um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure whether there's something wrong with this room or what. Yesterday's room that I had was very, very cool. Today like this. Okay. Alright, settle down. I, I wait for you to settle down. Because I'm kind like that. Okay? Alright. Okay. So, with the... Uh, oh, attendance is like appalling. <laughs> okay, alright. So, with NATO, alright, today we do NATO. Next week, we do OSCE. These are both the security organizations. <coughs> These are both the... Can you hear if I have the mask on, right? You want to go one seat beyond? Then I can pull it off. Mm. No difference, right? Doesn't it? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, both of these uh, security organizations, um, I would say, for exam purposes, all right, uh, NATO tends to be more frequently tested. That means, not to say that OSCE is not tested, all right, uh, but NATO tends to be the more common option for examiners, all right, number one. It's um, a case where I think practically all exam papers, right, uh, will feature a question on NATO. Some, some years, right, you do not see like OSCE or you may not necessarily see uh, WTO and so on, right? But with NATO, there's very little chance of it not coming up. So I would say that um, don't skip NATO in your revision, right? Have a good uh, solid understanding of NATO, right? It's, a, it's actually, a, and, and number two, related to that point, right? is that it is actually a very straightforward topic, right? If you look, <clears throat> if you look at all the past year exam questions on NATO, right, you will notice that the trend for asking questions on NATO largely remains the same, largely remains the same. 90% of the time, the, in, uh, the, the angle of inquiry on NATO questions, right, is actually the same thing. If NATO was established in the post-war period so as to address Soviet aggression, right, or to defend against Soviet aggression, right, why is it still relevant today? Why, how is it relevant today, right? That is perhaps like the most common exam question angle. Right. That means no matter how they phrase it, that means they could say that uh, you know, their favorite <clears throat> their favorite way of phrasing the question, right, uh, is usually you know they will refer to Soviet aggression as Soviet intransigence, intransigence, right. So they'll say uh, along the lines of you know if NATO was established to address Soviet intransigence or to keep the Russians out and so on, right. Uh, why is it still relevant, right? Or if they can give you a quote that features the idea that NATO is no longer relevant, right? So, uh, you know, uh, that it has engaged in mission creep. Mission creep meaning that it has outlived its purposes, right? So anything related to, is it still relevant? It has outlived its purposes. It has engaged in mission creep. It no longer, technically, uh, is an organization that defends the North Atlantic, right? So that means its name, right, the name itself, it's like a misnomer, right? That means it, it's, it's not an organization dedicated to the North Atlantic anymore, right? Then why is it still in existence, okay? So this is usually the angle of inquiry. So that means however they phrase the question, right? Almost 85% of the time, in fact, in fact, I would say 90% of the time, this is what the question on NATO basically is about, right? You could get an open-ended type question relating to NATO and OSCE, right, where they ask you about the uh, evaluation and the effectiveness of organizations that are dedicated to security, to peacekeeping, 
to defense, right? So that could be an open-ended question where you could use NATO as an example, all right? So that is another type of question, right? But that is for you to delineate the boundary and say, I'm going to use NATO as an illustration of, of uh, a defense organization or a security regime, right? Because NATO basically is part of a security regime or a... a a, a, no, it was a tech person, uh, or, a, or a, a, a defense, a part of a defense architecture, all right? So that's the second way you could use NATO, right? But the questions on, on uh, I mean, phrased like that, right, I find, I, I find is less common. The first type of question that I mentioned, that one is actually the more common one, okay? Then the other type of question that you could get where you could use NATO as a, a good case study Right, would be any question that asks you <coughs> um, in relation to organizations where the US plays a large role in, right? Okay, and uh, the angle could be because this this would be something that is slightly newer. All right, uh, I I am just thinking about it because um, I can tell you why I'm thinking about this angle. All right, number one. Uh, you know, when we had a meeting recently, uh, but not for not for this this program, but for UOL Foundation program also, it was an uh, and also relating to IR. Uh, and I mean, it was uh, that like your IR. It, IR is part of that course, right? Uh, the director of the program was talking about how with the online exams, right? They tend to be shifting their focus in the way they are phrasing the questions. So they are looking at how you could get more application style questions. Uh, and I think the way they were phrasing it, uh, it sounds like you're going to get an online exam again this year, right? No, uh, I they didn't confirm, right? But it sounds like it, right? So if and and if they are specifically mentioning, right, that you uh, we are looking at definitely more application application style questions, you've got to understand you would be technically the third batch to do an online exam, which means they have had enough time to recalibrate the way they ask questions. All right? Okay. So they say that means, you know, the idea of application questions for your batch, there's a higher chance, right? So, you know, they could tweak the existing type of question. So we cannot be on the lookout and say that, oh, you know, we are going to, uh, we can look at past year exam questions and gauge the trend, right? It could change, right? So what you, uh, and, 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 Right, for one of the exam papers for IR, right, for the foundation course which I teach, there was a specific question uh, the year before on Trump. All right, and, uh, and this is a foundation course, huh? all right, okay, and they specifically asked about uh, what is the impact of Trump's reign or legacy, right, on the global platform, on, on world affairs and global platform, right, and you would know, right, that in the case of a couple of international organizations, which we are looking at, NATO in particular, and ICC as well, right? These are the two organizations in particular. I mean, he has grumbled about other organizations while he was in power, right? But these two in particular was the ones where he highlighted that, you know, for, for NATO, in the case of NATO, uh, that, you know, the Americans are basically funding European defense, right? Okay, so the logic, uh, and, and then for ICC also, you know, uh, you know, uh, USA has never been a party state to the International Criminal Court, right? So my uh, guess is that you could also get, I, I'm just, you know, plucking this out of nowhere, right, based on that exam paper, thinking that you could get a question. This is a potential qu an angle of inquiry that they could test you on, right? What is the effect, and, and especially, especially, right, uh, looking at how there has been a shift, right, uh, since Trump, right, so from Trump to Biden, there may be a shift, right, about, you know, the U.S. reclaiming <clears throat> its spot on the global stage, right, wanting to, you know, start to play an active role because, you know, during those four years, you did see a decline. It was something that was actually, you know, pointed out, right, there was a decline of the U.S. presence, right, on global on the global platform, right? It's, they seem to be shirking away, you know, as a result of America first policy and so on, right? So you could get a question on that. What is the effect, right, of, you know, uh, the Trump presidency, right, uh, you know, on, on the global platform in international organizations, 
NATO would be one example because of the grumbling, you know, uh, relating to, you know, um, how, you know, the Americans have been majority, you know, paying a good chunk of the, the defense budget of the Europeans. They're paying too much. They want, you know, the other NATO members to pull up their socks and so on, right? So that is another angle, right? So it need not necessarily be a case where they ask you specifically because that would be too specific and too narrow a question to ask you specifically, you know, what is the impact of the Trump reign on specifically NATO? But if they ask you in general, right, NATO would be one of the case studies, right? Maybe ICC could be another case study. And then you could have a generic take on, you know, uh, you know, the role that superpower plays, because this is an IR course after all, right? So the role that superpowers play, right, in directing, dominating international organizations, right? That means, you know, the logic about how, uh, you know, you know, do, in that case, would Mia Shimers claim that we have invested too much faith? Remember, you know, remember Mia Shimers claim, right? That we have invested too much faith in international organizations, right? They are actually epiphenomenal. They are the sum of the interests of the drive, the direction, the policy agenda of the great powers. Right, you know that would be like more of a, a you know a realist you know approach to looking at international organizations, right? Correct, right? Uh, so you could get a, you know a, a question that is along those lines. So it need not even necessarily be on 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 Trump per se, right? But you could get you know a question that you know sort of hints at it and says you know uh, looking at current uh, you know uh, events, how world leaders have been approaching the global platform, how world leaders have been utilizing international organizations, right, uh, as a result of increased tensions around the world and so on and so forth, right? You know, they could give you a particular kind of context. And then ask you, right, you know, do you agree whether, you know, it is true that organizations really, right, are a sum of the great powers' interests, right? Then you could play around Right, with that statement and, you know, and then explain, you know, uh, using NATO as an example. While some great powers may claim, you know, like great powers like the US, right, particularly during Trump's reign, may claim, right, that, you know, it is so that they are the ones driving the agenda. You know, the organization actually fulfills a far greater role, right, and that is integral to the defense, right, of the European region and beyond. Right, because that's the angle that we're taking with NATO. Right, it is no longer an organization that simply is, you know, a defense organization only for Europe. But it's basically seen as a, you know, part of a defense architecture, part of a <coughs> security community. Do you understand? Right. So these are the different ways that you could be either tested specifically on NATO, or you could be tested in such a way to use <coughs> NATO as a big chunk example in the, you know, in the exam question. So this is why. Right, I point out, you know, some of us have inclinations towards particular kinds of organizations. Like some of us incline more towards, you know, the economic or financial organizations or the trade ones. Or some of us, you know, um, uh, have interest in, say, the regional organizations like EU and Africa and so on. Right. So I know some people may not really be so, you know, keen or interested right, in, in the security ones per se. Right. But it is a good bet because the answer structure right, is largely quite standard. You, you understand what I mean? It's a standard way, in standard in the sense that, you know, the points that you would include in your argument is kind of there, right? Whatever I've given you, whatever I've asked you to read in Khan's Mings and Styles or, you know, the additional articles uh, that I've linked for you, the videos basically summarize everything for you, right? That, you know, basically gives you enough, you know, material to write literally any kind of, you know, substantial response and do well right, in, uh, you know, for, for this topic. And I would say this also, right, judging from marking past year prelim exam papers, number one. Number two, marking the, you know, the practice papers that students send me, right, okay. I do notice that students do tend to do better when they write an answer for the NATO question. The ones where there is problem a little bit are the type of, you know, open-ended questions where the thesis statement, you know, is is a bit mangled. Uh, the kind, the the EU one sometimes, you know, a little bit, uh, not not very well done also, right? Because students tend not to explain, uh, you know, the logic of intergovernmentalism versus supranationalism well enough because those are com they are complex concepts to uh, explain, 
But because this one is more straightforward, I do notice that the ans the quality of answers generally are better. Right? I'm not I'm not advertising for the NATO topic. Don't get me wrong. Right? Not because it's my pet favorite or anything. Really, honestly, it's not. Right? But I'm just telling you, based on past experience, this is where I see people score. Right? And of course, you want to choose a topic where you can score. Not say that it's easy to score, but I'm saying that that because of the way you can structure your answers, because of the the straightforwardness of the the way your answers can be stru structured, the straightforwardness of the ang angle of inquiry. What what else can they ask you? How if you, how can they complicate the topic? They can't really complicate the topic because the logic is that Russia was basically a, a threat then in the form of USSR. Has the Russian threat actually dissipated or not? Has it gone away? The logic is that has is Russia no longer considered a threat? Is is it is it no longer considered a threat? Can you, can you safely say that? Cannot, right? So the logic is that it is recalibrated, right? The threat remains, but in a different form. Maybe lesser, maybe less significant, not like how it presented itself, right? In the in that immediate uh, uh, post-World War II period, right? But it has recalibrated, and not to say that the threat is dissipated. So, you know, the logic is that, you know, the conditions under which NATO should exist as a defense organization basically remains in place, right? In fact, it's, it's a little bit more dangerous because of the type of threat that, made, that, that Russia presents uh, today, right? In, in terms of, you know, how um, I will go through this idea of the grey zone and the digital playbook, right? Versus, you know, uh, NATO's more traditional response, right? So you can actually get, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it is, it, the evaluation, right, will be more straightforward, you know, unlike, you know, an I, uh, like, you know, similar to the IMF evaluation where you just go ahead and say that, okay, these are the functions and IMF has not, you know, fulfilled a lot of the promises that it has made in terms of improving, right, uh, local economies like World Bank and IMF, you know, both of the organizations we use with the criticisms against it by the structural adjustment programs. So have this very straightforward answer. Likewise, you know, the answer for this one also is relatively straightforward. You understand? All right, so this is the rationale why I would say that this is a good topic, right? A lot of straightforward, you know, discussions that you can um, uh, engage in, all right? Okay, so what you want to do is, you know, basically all of this goes towards answering this one question, the effectiveness of NATO, right? Is it still, is it, is it effective? Right, of course, you know, there are some issues associated with it, right? But generally, is it, is it effective? If you would take, a, you know, a broader, more nuanced view, right? Is it effective? in the sense that it plays a large role, right, in the defense of that region and beyond. It may have extended, right? In fact, that would actually, you know, contribute to how effective it actually, you know, is, right? Or what, how important a uh, player it is, okay? All right, so that is the, the angle, right? So, you know, this is, you know, this is how you want to understand, you know, majority of the material that, you know, we've discussed here. I've given, I, I've, um, I'm including some of the newer developments, right? Something that, you know, has occurred very recently. I'll run through that with you. I've pulled together material from Khan Smings and Styles and, and so on and compiled it into the lecture notes. But I still would like you to take a look at the chapters that I have uh, included for you. I've also uploaded for you together with the lecture notes in eGlobal. Uh, an article about uh, NATO. So please download that one, right? There's an additional article, uh, a PDF article that I've uh, put inside for you. It's in the content page, okay? All right. Uh, separately, for the people who are here, the physical group, right? There is um, a recording. Uh, I, I put, posted a message in the news item yesterday. I don't know whether you all saw it or not. Uh, it takes about, apparently, it takes about three working days for the LT recording to, uh, you know, be... Uh, settled and uploaded, you have to access it. Uh, I checked it, right? You have to access it via the content page, right? Where I upload the notes for y'all, right? There is a subfolder. I my, my notes are in like the weekly notes. There's a subfolder called video recording. If you click on that, you can you can see it, okay? All right, but uh, 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 I, I don't upload it. It's like an auto thing that the system uploads by itself, right? Uh, and it says, I think it takes about three working days. I was looking in the the media gallery for the thing and I couldn't find it so I went and asked the office right but it, it's in the content page okay all right so you you uh, you got to wait all uh, right about three they say up to three working days but you can just refresh and check and see okay if it's not there 
uh, please let me know or send an email to student services and alert them. That means like after this, because if you alert them before the three working days, they're going to tell you that it's going to take three working days, right? So that means after our lesson, maybe by today is what Wednesday. So I don't know whether today is included, at least by next week, Monday. Right? So next week, Monday, if the recording is still not there, then you uh, email student services or CC me or whichever and then uh, let them know. Okay? All right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the Mackella reading, please do the Mackella reading. All right? You know, uh, you know, whatever else that you do, right? Please make sure you do the Mackella reading. Right? That one is important. Okay? All right. Because, you know, the Mackella reading is also useful uh, when we look at the, um, what's that? The OSCE chapter, right? Because I borrowed the idea from Mackella to also look at the OSCE chapter, all right? Okay, so that one is integral for both the organizations. So please make sure you do the uh, Mackella reading. The other one is that uh, before you go for the exams, because there are developments, all right, uh, you know, regarding NATO in particular, all right, uh, you know, in around Thanksgiving time, right, you know, Russia always, you know, comes up with something. I don't know why. All right, you know, it happened, you know, there was a meme a uh, couple of years ago, like Putin had, Turkey for Thanksgiving or something like that it was a couple of years ago. Uh, but, you know, again, there's been some development. So, please do yourself, do me and do yourself a favour. If I, of course, after the, you know, the prelims and after the revision class, uh, I will still upload things into the e-global content page. I've always done this with the other batches also because this one, IR course, right, you cannot just sit on dated articles. So I will still continue if I find anything interesting or relevant, right? I will still label it, you know, for whatever topic and upload it into the e-global. But for NATO, because there is a development that is occurring, right? Please, before you go for the exams, right? Please go and do a quick Google search, right? Uh, you know, in addition to anything that I upload for you to make sure that, you know, you're up to date with anything, you know, that has developed, right? You know, uh, okay, all right. I would recommend it for all organizations, but NATO in particular, because there is an ongoing uh, issue right now. Okay? All right? So please, uh, you know, make sure that you, you uh, keep up to date. <laughs> okay. Later on, I will play the video. I've already opened it. I will do the share screen style and we we'll, and we'll watch the video. All right? Uh, so what you want to... Uh, this one. Can you please highlight uh, the founding treaty, Article 5? Okay. This one, all right, uh, what happens is that a lot of students who write exam answers uh, on NATO, right, tend not to refer to this. I would, if, if I was an examiner, I would say any exam answer, right, on NATO should include mention of Article 5, right? You don't, you know, you don't have to have the entire phrase in, but at least a mention of Article 5. I noticed that a lot do not, and, and if you look at examiner's commentaries also, right, that's one of the first things that they point out, that there, there should be a reference to Article 5, right, okay, of the Washington Treaty, because this is basically what legitimizes NATO action, all right? So please make sure that you include it, right? This is like the, remember we talked about the juridical nature, right, the, the legal foundations, right, of the international organizations. <clears throat> what are they based on? The juridical nature, remember the very first like lecture that we had, right? So this is something that I, you know, you need to discuss. Just like how, when you talk about the effectiveness of the UN, our first response, right, will be to talk about the sovereignty clause and refer to Article 2.7 in the Charter, right, relating to, uh, the, relating to sovereignty and how that impacts on the effectiveness, how that lends to the mandate of, uh, the, of the United Nations. Same thing down here. Right, because this is what legitimizes, uh, uh, you know, the the organization. All right, okay. So you know, basically, uh, what you want to highlight uh, is the logic about, you know, you know, pull out, you know, maybe you can summarize. You know, you can mention that, you know, Article Five, right, you know, of the Washington Treaty, you know, which is the, you know, the founding treaty of NATO, is what uh, provides the juridical basis for uh, NATO's mandate. Then what you do is you look at, you know, you look at the, the the actual, you know, clause itself, right? And you write in your own words or you summarize. So you pull out certain things, right? So what you say, the parties to this treaty reaffirm their faith in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the UN, desire to live in peace with all peoples and governments. You're looking at safeguarding freedom, common heritage, civilization. What are you basically talking about? Number one, security regime. Collective security, the idea of collective security, right? Number two, you're talking about the role and function 
that this organization plays right in safeguarding peace right it contributes to the you know the idea of maintenance of peace security order right in that particular region or or you know if you look at the phrasing right uh you know where is it uh? the the parties to this treaty that already is like a clue it's not even you know really about the region per se it is about who signs the treaty because it's about the parties of the treaty right so you know an, a, a critical thinking student with you know to argue against the logic about you know uh, if they give you a quote or they give you a, a, a charge against NATO to say it's outlived its usefulness because it no longer is about the defense of the North Atlantic. Then you can point out, <clears throat> but Article 5 highlights that it is committed to the defense and the collective security of those that are parties to this treaty. Who are the parties to this treaty now? How have they accepted more members? So you can even manipulate that point, right? The logic here, you know, for this level two type of causes, right, and if you look at the examiner's commentary, you'll notice the angle is slightly different, especially for this cause. I noticed that, you know, they tend to point out a thinking student, an excellent answer, you know, would even question, and sometimes they actually point out, you can even question the question, as in, you know, look, if you go and take a look at the past papers, especially the more tricky questions, right, uh, or the questions, you know, with the quotes and so on, right, they'll actually point out, you know, and like a thinking student or, you know, not a thinking student, that's what I say, an excellent answer. An excellent answer, you know, would actually question this aspect of, you know, the, the phrasing in the question to interpret it, right? And to say that, you know, does this even exist or, you know, why is it so and, and so on, right? So you can just basically look at this idea. So the logic is to have an understanding that is so clear that you can you know, pick it out and say, yeah, it's about the parties to the treaty. So how can it be irrelevant? There are people, no, sorry, there are states who are still members, right, who are still signing the treaty, right? Okay, so that's the logic down here. Then you also want to talk about, you know, freedom, common heritage, civilization of the people. Again, again, it goes towards this idea. This is why I wanted you to read the McKellar reading because McKellar, right, talks about the idea of a security community. It's not even about a security architecture, but about a security community. That means there's this bond, there's this glue, there's this identity, that the, the, the member states actually have, right, you know, as a result of being part of NATO. It's similar to the idea, you know, when you, if you discuss EU, right, when you talk about EU, what do you refer to, right? Yeah, EU is not all, like, Western European states anymore. You've got member states who are from, you know, other parts of, of Europe, right? The logic is that, what does it represent? A European identity, right? So the logic here is also about the identity, the community angle. That is McKellar's angle. We will use that for both, you know, uh, NATO as well as OSCE. All right, okay, all right. And then, uh, and then it is about you know NATO promoting, uh, you know, the idea of principles of democracy, individual liberty, rule of law. These are all, you know, parts of of the logic of you know the juridical standing, right? What it does it seek? What does it represent, right? Promote stability, well being, right? And the last part here, obligating all members to uh, all member states to assist the member attack when the state consents. So number one, consensus building. No state is given up its sovereignty, right, and is being forced to participate in the security organization, right? So it is consensus building, which is part of the discussion. One of the points that we are, you know, we are highlighting. Number two, it reiterates the logic of the collective security regime. This one thing already, just looking at the the, the Article Five, right? How many points can you generate out of it? Right, it can easily form the basis of an introduction, right? Uh, that you know cements the idea of why was it relevant and why it continues to be relevant. It is not one of those charters, right, or, or, or like one of those mandates like the UN, or oh, committed to world peace and security, like your Miss Universe, you know, logic down here, right? It is very specific, right? And it is still applicable. It's not, you know, something that's so generic. Like, how does the UN contribute to maintenance of peace and security? That, that is still, you know, a, a very big chunk that needs to be broken down, right? You know, and there is a lot of, you know, gaps and loopholes and so on. This one here, no, it's actually quite, it, it is, it, it, I mean, of course, the idea of, you know, what is peace, what is stability and so on, that one is still open to questioning. Uh, the idea of, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, what the member states, uh, how they respond in terms of obligation 
and you know the logic about when the state consents and so on. That one also open to interpretation, right? But it is far more straightforward, uh, you know, and and clear, right? And you can actually develop an argument just looking at the charter. Uh, I mean, sorry, just looking at the clause in the charter. That is why. I highlight the significance or the importance of mentioning Article 5. A lot of students will talk about everything else, but no mention of Article 5. Right? It is integral to the discussion. Please make sure you know you put an asterisk on it or something, right? And include it in the discussion. So let's just go on. Okay, yeah. All right, including the discussion. Okay. All right. Uh, I will play the video later. Lah. Okay. All right. Um, let me do some of this background discussion first, then we'll play the video. <coughs> All right. Okay, so this one here. Okay, what you want to highlight that it is, you know, both a political, right, <coughs> a political or diplomatic plus a military alliance. All right, so that is one way to uh, describe it, right? And, you know, the, the logic that, you know, it's two-pronged, right? One aspect is, you know, political. What is the, you know, political aspect, right? Uh, it promotes democratic values, encourages consultation, cooperation on defense, right? Building trust, attempting to prevent conflict. So that's the political angle, right? The military angle obviously would be the peaceful resolution of disputes, right? So what you could say, right, which is what I've indicated there, that, you know, you have the, the two-pronged angle is necessary because the logic is that, you know, it's in the spirit of, you could say, liberalism because they attempt to resolve the dispute mediation, right, via diplomatic efforts first. You will always notice that, you know, um, NATO will issue statements, right, and they'll say, we are very concerned about developments in, an in, in this particular area, uh, you know, we have, you know, con con issued a condemnation. There is an issue, right, you know, like how for, you know, currently, uh, Jen Stoll, what's his name? How do you pronounce it? Jen Stolen Stolzenberg, is it, or something like that. Uh, Stolberg, or some Stolzenberg. Okay, never mind. Jen, uh, you know, the, the, the secretary, secretary General of uh, NATO, right? You know, will highlight, um, you know, uh, will release a statement and say that, you know, the issue that is uh, occurring, you know, in the border uh, area or with Ukraine, you know, is of great concern uh, because, you know, there's increased activity, uh, you know, by Russia, by stationing all their troops and so on, right? So there is, you know, there is an attempt to highlight, there's an attempt to engage in dialogue and so on. Okay, so that is the two-pronged, uh, you know, uh, aspect, right? Military and political. This one also, I would say, a lot of students do not mention it, right? Which I think is actually, you know, uh, integral to the discussion, right? They tend to, you know, students always tend to focus on maybe the, the actual, I mean, the danger of, you know, writing an answer for these kinds of topics, right? Uh, you know, especially when you have like, examples of peacekeeping missions or conflict that arises, <clears throat> the danger is that your answer ends up being very descriptive rather than analytical, right? So what did I do? When I looked at, you know, describing, it's just saying that the organization has, you know, has got a two-pronged approach, uh, sorry, uh, dip uh, political slash diplomatic and military. Uh, that would be descriptive because you're basically telling the marker, these are the, you know, two approaches to it. An analytical answer, right, would say that, okay, there are these two approaches, right, and uh, why, you know, is it necessary to highlight, you know, the diplomatic or political angle, right? It's because, you know, it is uh, an, an organization like what we understand IOs to be forum for discussion, consensus building, right, mediation, dialogue, and then, you know, you want to drag in the idea of liberalism if you want, you know, just, just to, you know, mention it, right? So that would be a... This, uh, that would be an analytical answer as opposed to a descriptive answer. In level two, right, you cannot afford to write stories, right, and just say, you know, in the 80s this happened, in the 90s this happened, this happened in this mission, that happened in that mission. Yeah, those are examples to illustrate success, failure, and so on. But you need that, that statement, you know, that, that attaches itself to the illustration, right, to say that this is what I make out of it. This is what happened. But this is what I understand is an implication or a consequence or a result or, you know, uh, you know, my understanding, my evaluation of it, right? So you need to go that one step further. This is why a lot of answers, right, for this cause, right, I notice 10, the, I mean, sorry, the, the grades, the grades for the answers, right, tend to hover in the 50s or maybe like you're in the 60s and like, you know, the grade is almost touching the 70 but cannot touch the 70 yet because, the answers tend to be descriptive rather than be analytical. Level two and three, they're expecting, and in fact, level one already expecting analytical answers because technically, 
It's just university, right? So level two, especially, right, expectations are higher. Please don't always tell stories. I notice these kind of topics, right? Students always, you know, they're just, you know, rambling on about what happened. Don't ramble, right? You know, come to the point, use the illustration and explain what is, you know, your understanding or evaluation. What, what IR concept that we discussed, right, in lecture one to five, can you attach to your understanding of whatever you're discussing? Understand? All right. Okay, can you please write this down to remind yourself? Right, that you need to do this. All right. Okay. Uh, you know, this is this this is all exam strategy. How to score? Content is all that. Right. You can sit down and read everything. You can even memorize and whatever. Right. Or you can refer to it during the exam. Content is all there for you. How do you strategize to answer the question in the most effective manner? Right. That will get that will get the marker going. Hey, nice answer. I've ever. That's how I react when I when I mark papers. You know, I said. This is a nice answer, you know, like, and, and then sometimes, right, when I look at the way students answer the question, I'm like, yeah, you know, this makes so much sense. I, you know, I really agree with this, you know, I want to explain next time when I want to talk about it, right, I want to explain it like this also. Sometimes, you know, you actually have students who actually go that one extra step, right, and think about it in a slightly out of the box or slightly different way, right? I'm not asking you to do all of these extra stuff, right, but I'm asking you to just make sure that it's not descriptive. Go back and read. Read the answers again. Uh, you will realize, you know, is your answer about the topic or are you answering the question? Is it analytical or is it, is it descriptive? Always ask yourself that, right? Students do not, do not you know, pay enough attention to this angle, all right? Uh, of course, Nito said to play a key role, right, in the establishment of the new democracies, right? So what you could say, you know, as a result of this, right, is that it, you know, you can talk about, you know, the idea of capacity building, you can talk about the idea of providing the identity. Remember, I talked about that earlier on, right? From the security community. So, it offers aspiring members, right? Uh, you know, to NATO, potential advice, targeted assistance, right? But those that want to be part of NATO, they are expected to meet certain key requirements, right? So, it is not, you know, a case where really, really anybody can become a member of NATO. But the logic is that they do provide, you know, this capacity building angle, right, uh, you know, for aspiring members, right? So that is what is important, right? And it gives them the, you know, this idea of you are part of this organization, you're part of this community. It's an identity that is provided, gives them confidence, right? Which is very important for these transitionary states, right? Who are neither here nor there, right? Who are emerging out of the shadows of the former USSR, right? You know, and then you've got the tussle that exists, the suspicion of current Russia, right, of, you know, uh, organizations like NATO and EU in particular. We'll look at that one, you know, uh, when we look at the, uh, you know, the, the Joint Council, right? So what you want to highlight is, you know, that, you know, the logic here is that, you know, it provides some kind of stability basis, right, for these trans transitionary states, right? And it locks them into the security network or, you know, what you can refer to the security community. All right, then you've got you know, NATO membership, right? And then you, you know, the logic about how it is open, right, to any other European state in a position to further the principles of this treaty, contribute, right, to the security of the, of the, um, uh, what, North Atlantic area, right? And they have a membership plan. All decisions taken by consensus, right? So the logic of consensus, every member country or mem member state, right, regardless of size, power, capacity, right, has equal say in the discussions and decisions, right? So that is something that is important, right? You know, in comparison to other organizations where you have the dominance of the agenda, right, by particular states as a result of being more prominent in the, you know, on a, on a global platform like, say, IMF and World Bank, right, where the voice is determined <clears throat> by the, you know, the, the quotas, which is calculated you know, uh, in terms of looking at the strength of the economy on, uh, you know, relative to others, right, on the global platform, right? So that makes sense also. So you want to highlight that as well, right? And they are committed. So this one is, you know, the logic that I explained to you earlier on uh, as a, you know, uh, when I pulled it out, pulled the idea out from the Article 5 itself, right? Committed to the ideas, right, of what what is the cornerstone? What is the hardware, right, you know, 
you know, can, can be a bit traumatic if you want, right? Okay, particularly if you want to push a particular angle, right, in your exam answer, you want to take a kinder, gentler view, or you want to put this, push this angle, right? Committed to individual liberty, democracy, right, talking about human rights, right? If you want to show that stark difference between how, you know, uh, you know, like, for example, Russia approaches, uh, you know, the, the, the logic of security within that region, right, the suspicion, versus what this represents, Right. Okay. So you know you've got human rights, the rule of law. Right. These values, right, are at the heart of your transatlantic bond from NATO. Right. So you know that I that, that that is why I told you the McKellar article is relevant because if you are talking about a security community, if you are talking about an identity, then the mention of these values only strengthens that argument. Right. Because it all goes hand in hand. Right, so you you know you can't just mention security community and then not expand on the idea. So you say if it's a community, then the com the members of that community are glued, bonded via these type of values. Correct. Then only can you have a success a successful cohesive membership base. Right. Okay. So that is why these points are all important to highlight. All right. Okay. Here, summarized, you know whatever I could find. And from a couple of different articles and, and things like that, right? Put it together for you. Um, you can basically, and I, I put it in themes also, right? <coughs> the idea here is that, you know, depending on how you want to structure your arguments or depending on what the question is, right? You can use any of these themes to craft your introduction, craft the background paragraph after your intro. Like I always tell you, right? Intro, try to keep it short, right? Address the question. Thesis statement, level two people, please put in the thesis statement at the intro. Thesis, can I please mention to you, uh, you know, this and now that I'm seeing you all here, right? Please, uh, your thesis statement uh, is not telling the marker, in this paper, I will first provide a background of the organization. I subsequently will illustrate some examples to explain why I think the organization is successful. That's not a thesis statement. That is telling the market what you're going to do, right? Thesis statement is your one to two to three line response, right, to the question itself. So the question asks you, is NATO still relevant today? If that's your question, your thesis statement will be, yes, I think NATO is still relevant today because then your justification. No. I don't think NATO is relevant today anymore because your justification. That's your thesis statement. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be very long, right? Imagine if you look at the question, right? Just tell yourself, if your friend was asking you that question to your face when you're discussing, you're just sitting down having a tea, right? And then your friend asks you, hey, you think NATO is still relevant? Or? No, nah, it's not. That's your thesis statement. Nah. That's the angle of your thesis statement. The students will, will, will not put that in. Right, they will ramble, 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 ramble. Right, right at the end, they know then the mark, then and, and then as the marker or the reader, right, the marker or the reader has got to kind of figure out. Okay, uh, you know, some are very are really not clear. They are really not there. Right, the marker coming by the end of the paper, right, has to figure out. Okay, so based infer based on what has been discussed, right, uh, it looks like the the student is actually agreeing with the statement. That's not how you write an academic paper. You have to make it clear. Number two. Students do tend to run out of time. 90% of the time, right, when you look at all the three papers, and some people have sent me their, their, their final exam, you know, copy, right? Uh, you know, to say, what do you think about, you know, the answers? Or, you know, why do you think I've gotten such a low grade? Or wh wh whatever, right? You see the first two questions, you can clearly see, right? It's, and it's a trend. After having marking, you know, for quite a, num quite a while, right? You always see first two questions very nicely written. Last question, huh? Always shorter, lesser points are thrown in in point form. Some in even with the extended time of six hours. Last time is only three hours, one hour per question. Now likely you're going to get likely you're going to get six hours. I do not know that right? you may get four. I don't know, right? Don't don't come after me saying that I jinxed it, huh? okay? But you know, four to six hours now. Okay, let's just put it there. Let's be prepared, right? Students so still run out of time. Last question always not very well done. And NATO, right, if you if you look at the way the, the, the questions, you know, are structured in that paper, right, these topics are o, uh, OAU, AU, ICC, NATO, these are the tail end, right, these are the bottom of the paper. 
So please, you know, allocate your time properly. Do not wait until last minute, uh, you know, uh, to write your thesis statement at the end of the paper. God forbid you run out of time, right? Your thesis statement never, your opinion and your thesis statement never ever makes it into the answer itself. That's why I always say, put it in the intro, right? It saves, and, and it provides the marker the directions. Marker already knows. And it helps you prevent yourself from contradicting. The number of students who I've seen, right, who say, yes, I agree, and then subsequently, as they start writing, right, they realize, you know, the answer goes unwieldy and they're actually writing an answer about, you know, how they disagree, right? If you put it right at the beginning, there's no chance or, or there's very little chance you're going to end up contradicting yourself, right? So you look at these different themes, right? I, I'm sorry. It's okay. Let me do this. I'm going to close the, the, the this thing, the chat and whatever, so you can see a bit clearly, right? I'll open up the chat again later. Can you see? Uh, how I, you know, how how you uh, how how this has been labeled, right? There are different themes. So what you can do also is this: we look at it. Uh, let's just look at the theme first, right? How NATO functions as an international security hub. How it you know relates to collective defense, right? Or we you know what are the standing forces, right? Let me just run through. Huh? They have troops and equipment, funding, deterrence, right? These are all themes that you can use to answer your question. Right, so that means you know if they ask you a question, how uh, okay uh, is NATO still relevant? Okay, so let, let's just use that as our running angle of inquiry. Right, is NATO still relevant? Yes, it is relevant. If that's your answer, right? And how do you explain why it is relevant? Because it engages in, for example, crisis management. So that is your overarching theme. Then you go on to explain. Okay, in ninety five they did this. You know, in uh, 2011, they did this, right? Uh, in, uh, you know, 2021, they've done this. Rather than to just say, in 1995, NATO has done this. 2011, they've done this. 2021, they've done this. That is just descriptive. But if you park all of that and package it into a paragraph and say that these are expressions, right, of NATO's, uh, you know, attempts, successful attempts at crisis management, Right? And then you can have another paragraph that says, these are the instances where crisis management was less than successful. That is more analytical. It's actually only two to three sentences extra. But that changes a descriptive answer into an analytical answer. It's just two to three sentences only. There's not much difference. Right? But it's just the addition of the theme. Right? Same thing, you know, when you have uh, the logic. <clears throat> Look at the, the number 10, the open door. Right? When you get a question on, oh, NATO, you know, uh, it's a misnomer, right? It has engaged in, mis sorry, engaged in mission creep because it no longer it just committed to the defense of those that are located in the North Atlantic region, right? Then what can you say? I disagree with that because NATO has recalibrated to have an open door policy. Then you go on to explain. So that again functions as a theme. Do you understand? So either you can, you know, borrow any of these ideas to, you know, have an overarching uh, view, right? Like an overall view, you know, to include in your uh, introduction, right? sorry, in the paragraph after your intro to say that, oh, okay, these are the different, you know, uh, activities that NATO engages in, such as deterrence, such as crisis management, then you have a quick example for that. You could use it, you can use, combine a couple of these ideas, right, together in one paragraph to provide a background to NATO, right, before you start engaging in your discussion. Or you can use individual points, right? With the, you know, this, 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 this side. Can you see the ones that's numbered? Crisis management, cooperative security, uh, cooperative security, open door. Hey, sorry, the previous slide. Where is it? Uh, uh collective defense. Uh, you know, standing forces. Right. Each of these could be one paragraph, right? In your exam answer. Okay, this is what the standing force. Uh, say, for example, you want to talk about the capacity of NATO. Right, so you label it, okay, you know, in this section, I want to discuss the capacity of NATO. So I want to talk about standing forces. I want to talk about, you know, uh, the command structure, how that contributes to it. I want to talk about the member states. Do you understand how you can utilize the information here, right? And each one of these, you know, I've, I've of course, I've given, you, I've given you summary, right? You know, I, and I've given you a couple of points relating to each of this. When you do your revision or when you read your Khan's links and styles, right, uh, you know, you can add on additional points that you would like, right, you know, based on your understanding, based on your interpretation, right, to expand any of these areas if you would like. Do you understand? All right, so you can use this as like a stepping stone, you know, for crafting your notes. This is, and, and I put this here like this, right, to show you, this is how you can do up 
your revision notes for other topics as well. Not just for this course or any other course, right? You think about, okay, this is my whole, my whole chapter, right? I, how I break it down into different themes. Because like I said, level two, level three, right? They are looking for this analytical angle. When they see the themes, you know, when they see you describing things like the economic effect, the, you know, security effect, the developmental effect, right? Funding, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, when you're looking at the effectiveness or origins and so on, right? When you split it up like this and have this structure, this organization, you are definitely bound to do better, right? Because it really pushes you, pushes the answer to the next level altogether. It does push the answer to the next level rather than ramble, ramble, ramble. You understand? Okay? All right? Okay. Any questions so far? All okay, yeah? The pace, okay? Okay. <clears throat> let's, uh, okay, let's do this, huh? Let me... Okay, wait, wait. Now, let me open up the... the uh, uh, where's the chat? Okay, let me open up the chat first. Okay, and let me do this. Okay, let's do the, the next few slides, right, relating to the institutional origins. Right, let me finish that up and then uh, we go for the lunch break, okay? All right, so we don't break the thing, okay? So when you look at the institutional origins, right, what you want to... Okay, what you want to describe with the institutional origins, like, you know, what I highlighted to you earlier on, right, is that... <coughs> Sorry both the uh, political and military organization, right? So there's the dual institutional nature or the two-prong. Remember, just not use the word two-prong, right? So dual nature, two-prong, right, has got implications, right? And um, what it does is that it allows it to be more flexible, right? So, you know, since 1949, how it has changed, right? Depending on how you, you know, understand, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the two different aspects of political, uh, uh, political diplomatic, versus military, right? So political slash diplomatic versus the military angle, all right? And then, you know, of course, you know, sometimes you want to have a little bit of background. You can summarize, you know, the background type of, background part about, you know, which are the founding members, right? Uh, where I would think it becomes useful to include, uh, you know, like how many states, you know, were, you know, uh, the founding members, you know, where they signed, uh, you know, uh, who were the ones who signed the treaty and so on. That one, would be, you know, good to, you know, mention when you want to talk about how membership has expanded, right? So it started off as an organization, uh, you know, catering to only, you know, this group, right? This number of states. And then since then, it has grown. And then the implication of it growing, has it, you know, made the organization less effective? Has it allowed the organization to broaden its scope? Has it impacted on the way the organization responds to... Uh, different issues that arise, you know, relating to security and defense and so on, right? So that is where I think the numbers, right? Like how we know we discussed uh, with WTO, remember, right? When we talked about, you know, by the time it came to the last few rounds, right? You were noticing that there were so many states on board that get, right, was unable to, you know, accommodate, you know, this cacophony of, you know, developing states who are all clamoring, right? For, you know, there was a division within the developing states, you know, it, First, you already have a division, developed versus developing. Then among the developing states, you already have that, you know, that, that disagreements, right? So that kind of angle, when you talk about the increase in number, how does it contribute to the effectiveness of the organization? So here, right, you know, you, you meant if, if you're going to use this idea, I would, you know, approach it in the same direction, right? How has it impacted, right, on the ability of the organization to respond, right? Or how has it uh, contributed to it expanding the agenda? Okay, you understand the logic now, yeah? Okay, so, you know, don't just dump it in. If the logic is this, right? Everything that you write, you want to use it in such a way that if you're putting it in, it is contributing to answering the question. Don't just put it in for the sake of putting it in. Just because it is mentioned in the lecture notes or just because it's mentioned in the subject guide. How can I make this useful? Right, so you're not wasting your time writing rambling. That, you know, you notice I'm talking about rambling things, right? Because really, I the my concern is when you know there are rambling answers, and the rambling answer does not answer the question, right? So that is why I'm emphasizing this. Also, I'm fresh from marking, right? So, uh, you know, I my brain is you know tuned towards like you know these are the mistakes that I've been noticing. All right, okay. All right, uh, and you know it is um, you know it was really the original the, sorry the original focus and the original initiatives right really 
were, you know, um, regional, but it has transformed into an international organization, right? By, you know, by virtue of current membership, okay? All right, uh, take a look at, you know, uh, of, of course, you know, in the post-Cold War era, right? How has the shift occurred? So that that is telling to you, that is the turning point. The post-Cold War era, right? That is where you see these changes occurring. No exam answer, right, can, you know, write about uh, NATO, right, without making reference to the significance of the post-Cold War era, right? So you need to, you know, like I always say, the timeline, right, you know, which students also tend to, not to emphasize on too much, I do not know why, right? But the timeline in many of the chapters, in many of the topics is actually very relevant to the analysis because it highlights to you, this is the, remember, you know, in political science and IR, we like to talk about window of opportunity or critical juncture. This is at the critical point. This is what attributes, you know, to the, uh, sorry, this is what contributes to the changes, right? This, you know, there is a change environment that exists. What <clears throat> has the changes in the environment, right? Uh, done to contribute to the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the organization. Why did it need to change? Because the environment in which it operates now changes, right? Okay, so that is, in, you know, important. You know, the timeline video is also, you know, very, it's, it's a good video to watch because it shows you at which junctures, right, you know, uh, what events have occurred, what has uh, happened. Later on, we have time, right, uh, I'll play it uh, for you all, Okay. All right, uh, if, if I don't have time, then you'll just go and, you know, watch it on your own, okay? All right. <clears throat> okay, if you look at this part here, all right, the creation of NATO, right, you know, came about because of a major shift in the distribution of power, right, in the international system, right? So, you know, what is the shift in power? So, remember, you've got multipolar, right, uh, in your, you know, World War I, World War II period, right? Then after that, post-World War II, what do you get? You get the preponderance of the US. When you go to the Cold War period, what is that? What was the distribution of power? Bipolar, right? Then uh, subsequently, it shifts to unipolar. Currently, currently, what's the distribution of power? Huh? Bipolar, bipolar? Sure or not, today? Currently, why, why bipolar? So can it be bipolar? Cannot. It, it, it is. Um, it is a. Uh, it's difficult, you know, to actually say that it's bipolar because what when when you say bipolar, it means you know the the distribution of power is really evenly distributed, right, between the two. So I would say this. You see, this is why I mentioned this because because the rise of China. I'm not, I'm not saying that you're. I'm not saying that you're wrong to think about the rise of China. It's correct. To think about the rise of China, but what happens is that you know there is a, 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 a mistaken way of writing this. Some students will say that it's moving towards bipolar, right? Some students would say it's moving towards uh, you know multipolar, right? Very difficult to uh, make arguments uh, for bipolar, right? Because it it is not at this point, right? Uh, in, in fact, uh, in recently, you know, the last month or so, right? There have been a flurry of op-ed articles, right? You know, they've been highlighting, uh, and I don't know whether it's like a strategic angle of these, you know, authors from Economist and Foreign, uh, what was that, Foreign Policy and Financial Times and so on. But, you know, they've been talking about how China has already hit, uh, risen, hit its peak, plateauing, and it's just stagnant, right? There, there's this logic, you know, that they're putting forward that it's already hit its peak already and there's, you know, and, and the only way, the only way forward is down. Right, that is one strand of thought. The other strand of thought is that it's rising and it's going to be able to compete on you know a more equal level and uh, you know uh, on par with the US. Some would go as far as to say that you know it's an economic superpower and it's you know overtaken the US already. But officially, right, the distribution of power in the international system today still has to be considered as unipolar, right? Even with the decline of the US on a global platform, with it, you know, being declared, you know, in the last maybe three to four years or so, especially Trump, after Trump came in, right, uh, you know, the, the flawed democracy and all of that. Even after that, right, uh, we still have to, uh, you know, highlight that uh, distribution of power is still unipolar in nature, right? Okay, so, you know, keep this in mind, please. 
All right. What you can say in your exam answer, if you want to discuss polarity, is to mention that it is uh, currently unipolar, but may be shifting in the near future. You cannot say it's already shifted. Right? So you can see there's potential for this distribution of power to change further. Right? Okay? And then you, know, you can leave it at that. But to say that it's already changed and shifted uh, you know, will probably get you into a little bit of trouble. Right, no, uh, earn you a question mark, right? In your in your exam answer, okay. All right. So what you want to you know uh, highlight, right, is to give a quick background, right, of the you know first pa first phase of the uh, Cold War, right, as a foil to you know what the polarity or the distribution of power looked like then, right, in that period, right. So what you want to highlight is you know maybe along these lines. First phase of Cold War, right, began in the first two years of post World War Two. You've got USSR consolidating control over the various states, right, of the Eastern Bloc, whereas the U.S. is beginning a strategy of what? Global containment, right, uh, you know, to challenge Soviet power, right? So this is how the dis <clears throat> this is how distribution of power basically looked like. What was the, you know, what was the, the two powers, right, basically doing in order to cement their positions, all right? And then uh, what you went, you know, want to, you know, be able to explain also, right, is the extension of military financial aid to Western Europe and creating the uh, NATO alliance, right? That is how you, you know, get the development, okay? All right. So what you want to highlight, right, is, you know, the logic of, you know, um, the forward defense, this part here, right? Can you see in the third bullet point, right? Uh, they wanted, you know, to uh, defend against the communist onslaught. You know, these phrases are all very nice to use. You know, please, I know some of y'all will write, you know, in your own words, right? But certain phrases you can keep, okay? And, you know, maybe put them in quotes, you know, attributed to Khan Spings and Styles or whatever, right? Uh, and, and so on. But these kinds of phrases like communist onslaught, Right, uh, the logic of forward defense, right, aiming to defend the west from the east, preventing an attack from happening by stopping an offense before it makes any headway, right. The logic of you know, uh, proactive, right, versus reactive, right, putting in place, you know, that's what a defense architecture is actually supposed to be all about. That is what collective security is actually all about, right. It is, you know, the logic of being proactive, right. So, all of these things, right. Uh, you know, contribute to, you know, the clarity of the argument, right? This is why, you know, I refer to it as, you know, um, uh, you know in a particular way, this is why I refer to it as a security community or a defense architecture and so on, okay? All right, let's look at the last slide before we go for the break. Uh, no, is it? I've got four slides, do I? Yeah, I've got, okay, last two slides, all right, okay. So when you look at, you know, um, this one, right? What you want to highlight, this is all the background part of it, right? Because it's all the origins. So they didn't want to, you know, um, include Germany, you know, obviously, uh, for, for obvious reasons, you know. So the logic here, when you want to talk about, you know, the, the conundrum, the dilemma, right? The conundrum in creating a defense architecture, you know, to deflect uh, the Soviet Union would basically require trusting Germany. Right, so that is you know the part down here, right? You know, but you have the fear, right, of wanting to you know include uh, you know Germany because you know sooner or later, you know, regardless of you know what the experience was in in the in the previous uh, you know conflicts, right, you would have to uh, include you know uh, German territory because they are vital, right, in holding the Soviets at bay, right? So you know the rationale is that um, it was a big leap of faith for those the the designers or the architects. Right of you know the the structure right of uh, NATO right okay and you know this basically you know was a cause of a rift right you know in the Western alliance right uh, the Europeans you know were basically worried about you know uh, you know rearmament of uh, Germany right and uh, you know they were thinking that you know this might actually provoke the Soviet Union and trigger you know conflict all over again right and the logic is that you know. Um, this third bullet point, you know, on this slide is something you may, may want to capitalize on. You know, the logic is that, you know, they, the US, uh, you know, at that point was not, you know, in a position, uh, you know, thinking about how they want to, uh, you know, <coughs> be a very active member of, uh, you know, this defense architecture, right? And prefer that, you know, Western Europe basically shoulder the burden by themselves. Come one round, one right full round back to Trump, right? And says, we are paying for your defense. We are too involved in European defense. But the logic is that defense of Europe 
stability, safety, defense, right, and peace in Europe is actually, you know, integral to, uh, you know, the stability elsewhere as well, right? It contributes, you know, like Trump basically got the idea wrong when he says that, you know, it's not about business, but it's actually, you know, a lot of their business, you know, at the end of the day, right? So that's something that you want to, you know, include in, right? Uh, you know, and then eventually, right, uh, you know, the US basically took charge, right, and uh, strengthened NATO, right, okay? So that, you know, is, is you, what you want to highlight is the attitude, right? This is, and, and, and I would say this, this is sort of like a running theme in several of the organizations that we are looking at. League of Nations, ICC, right? Uh, uh, what's that? NATO, okay? You know, what is the attitude? What is the response of the US, right? Despite basically being superpower, right? Why does it have, you know, or why does it take on this response to participation in these international organizations? Is it because it doesn't want to shoulder the burden? Is it because it, is, it feels that it has shouldered too much burden already and others are not pulling their weight? Is it, it has, does it have to do with cost? Does it have to do with the US right, determining its position and its approach to international organizations based on what its domestic agenda actually is? Right? You know, like how we say the US and increasingly China right, tend to use, say, for example, the UN foreign... Sorry, what's it? UN... UN Security Council as their foreign policy playground, right? You know, that's the logic down here, right? So that is another running theme, right, that you see, you know, in a couple of these different organizations across the cause also, right? So think about these things. Sometimes, you know, it is not just something that is related only to one chapter or one topic. How do you want to include this idea, right? You know, if you get an open-ended question, you know, just like, like what I started off by discussing, you know, that, that question that I plucked out from nowhere and I said, you could get a question on the role that the US plays, right? Okay, those who came in a bit later, please go back and watch the recording uh, because I mentioned this logic about, you know, the di different kinds of questions that you could get, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, that would give you some idea, right? So the logic is that, you know, this is one of those themes that, you know, runs across a couple of these different topics, okay? All right, so, you know, think about that when you are, uh, you know, looking at all the material, okay? Then uh, you've got, you know, the Paris Accords, right, uh, that provided for Germany's membership for NATO. So if you are referring to the origins or the historical background, please make sure that you watch the timeline video, the one that is down here. This timeline video, this one, where is it? Uh? This timeline video, please watch this timeline video because it highlights to you all the important junctures. Right, and it, you know, and, and the important junctures are attributed to certain, you know, uh, logic. Like, say, for example, you know, like your fifty-four Paris Accords, right? How does it, you know, create provisions for Germany's membership? And then you've got, you know, <clears throat> the treaty powers, you know, uh, you know, acknowledging uh, um, uh, Western Germany as the the legitimate representative, right? And then, you know, once you settle the legal status of West Germany, then you have the cementing of the institutional structure of NATO in place, right? Okay. And that, you know, will basically allow you to argue that this structure, uh, you know, largely remain in place until the end of the Cold War period. Okay. All right. So, you know, the stability of the organization, right? You know, you can, uh, you know, use to describe. Then, you know, if you describe the stability of the organization, then subsequently you can contrast that, right, to accusations that engage in mission creep. How has it changed? So mission creep would be more of a negative uh, expression, right? But if you say that the organization, right, has reinvented itself or it has taken on a different manifestation, Right, in order to address the recalibrated threat that exists, right, uh, in threatening the stability, the peace of the region, stability and peace of the member states, right, then that would be a nice foil. You understand? So it depends. Are you do you do you want to take a very critical view of the organization? Right? Then of course you would use the term mission creep. If you mission creep. Right, because you know that suggests that you know, like octopus legs, right? It has extended itself, <coughs> doing more than what it is actually supposed to do. Right, that's you know the idea of the creep, right? It's creeping, right? Uh, you know, and it has deviated. You know, that logic is that it's deviated. So you know, you know, deviation versus modification, right? Creep, mission creep versus recalibration. 
right? So it is just semantics, but it conveys to the marker what your intention actually is. So if you, you know, your your um, if your thesis statement says that you agree that NATO is sorry, uh, you you believe that NATO is still relevant, right? And then you use terms like oh, it is engaged in mission creep. Then there's a slight disconnect between you understand you understand where I'm going with this. There's a disconnect between your thesis statement and the way you're describing the development of the organization. But you say it's still relevant, and you say it is, you know, therefore recalibrated, uh, you know, itself. It has, you know, re the, the reimagined Russian threat, right, in the post-Cold War era. Then it is connected. There's a, there's a strong structure in your answer. You understand the logic down here? Why it is important to sort out your thesis statement first. Then it will allow you to decide how you want to structure the rest of your answer. When you, when you don't do that, you get a rambling jumble up answer that suggests to the marker that student is not entirely convinced, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, sort of like touching on all of these points. It is not a solid, structured, you know, uh, answer with a good flow. Very important, right? Okay, to ensure that that, you know, is, is correct. Uh, that, that, you know, uh, works like that. Understand? Okay, 1.15. I'll take it as 1.15. Come back at 1.30. By 1.30, okay? Take a break now. <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
This one, the, the one in the black, yeah. Sorry, can I remember your name? Can I remember your name? Okay, uh, are you going to be here? I'm just, I'm going to go washroom. I'm going to leave my stuff here. Okay? Yeah, okay, thanks.
The good Starbucks like, it's not crowded. Oh. Huh. <laughs> Surprised. Especially now they I think they have that one for one thing going on. Oh. Yeah, there's some there's some one for one offer. But for particular flavours only I think. Some oat milk thing and I don't Yeah, neither do I so oat milk and I, I think there's three two flavours, uh. Yeah yeah, that's what <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's one for one. Um, I remember seeing it in my email. No lah! Why is such thing? One for one. Oh, until today. 2nd, 29 November to 1st December, Venti, oh, you see, I, I'm like advertising for Starbucks out here, Venti almond, what, Venti size almond milk mo mocha frappuccino, uh, green tea frappuccino, and pumpkin spice frappuccino. Yeah, I don't read any of it, so. Ipan, happy? But you're not here. Oh, but you can go to any other Starbucks, uh. right? Yeah, I, I won't drink any of this. Not my thing. Uh, I, I, but I do want to get the, what's that, the toffee, toffee nut, that toffee nut crunch thing. That I missed it last year and I was so disappointed in myself. Huh? Yeah, they already have it already, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe later before I go back, I buy it. Uh, I, that that's the one that that's the one that I I really do like in comparison, huh? Huh? The the what? Hey, but he can hear me. Surprising. Maybe the mic is on. Uh. is it? I I wasn't even thinking of it, man. There's just now also I was using the mic. I'm not holding the mic. I put it down here. It's on. It's on. It's here. It's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if I don't use the mic, people in the virtual actually cannot hear. If I switch off the mic. Uh, if, I, if I'm at home, I do it from my MacBook. Uh, the, the speaker is the, the technically the mic. But here, I, I, I just don't want to hold it because when I hold it, I fidget. Then the crack rock, crack rock, crack rock. So, I, you know, I cannot keep still tight, you know. Yeah. Okay. Can we continue? Uh, you can Kenya? Yeah, okay, good. All back already, yeah? All right. <coughs> okay. So, let's uh, discuss the, um, you know, how it works, huh? All right. So, here, you know, you know usually the part where how, how it works, like I always tell you all, uh, use it, you know, to discuss structure, use it to highlight um, the idea of, you know, um, the secretariat, uh, who are the main decision makers, how is decision making conducted. That is what, you know, you want to uh, focus on when you talk about the logic of how it works, right? Okay. So, uh, the logic of, you know, the, 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 principal, the, the principal organ is your North Atlantic uh, Council, right? It meets, it meets twice a year. Uh, you know, at different levels, at the HQ in Brussels. So remember, that is what distinguishes uh, international organizations from just simply being a regime, right? If, if, if uh, NATO 
was just simply a regime, a collective security regime, then you wouldn't have a HQ, right? Okay, so remember that, right? And they meet at uh, summit level, all right? Uh, and usually uh, the summits are held at, you know, whichever key junctures or key moments, right? That is where they... Uh, can you please highlight that part about the summit meetings and the, the because that is what is significant, right? Uh, the summit meetings are significant because that is uh, the where key decisions are actually being made. <coughs> All right, uh, and the in the after the arrow, can you see the summit meetings are used to introduce new policy, right? Invite new members, launch your major initiatives, and reinforce partnerships, right? So if you go to the NATO website, right, and you look or, or you just Google like NATO summit meetings, it will give you a list of the various uh, summit meetings that have occurred. Uh, since 1949, this is the latest one, huh? all right, this is the latest update. So I went to the NATO website to make sure that, you know, the, the data is correct. So that's why I say you need to make sure, you know, in case by the end of this year, right, there's another summit meeting. Because last year, or was it the year? Last year, I think, and the year before also, there was a summit in December, all right, 3rd to 4th December. I can't remember if it was 2019 or 2020, but there was a summit in December, right? But so it's not exactly like at a standard fixed time, right? So before you go for your exam, please make sure that, you know, uh, you, you go and have a quick check, right, uh, as to whether there was any summit meeting after this. So the last one, right, uh, was on 14 June 2021. The next one is supposed to be slated, right, for uh, 2022 in Spain. Right, but like I said, you know, given uh, you know uh, 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 developments right in uh, Ukraine, right, uh, there may be another meeting or so, right. So please make sure uh, that you double check, right? Okay. Uh, sorry, I forgot to click uh, enter after I gave you the link. Uh, so um, I think you just copy and paste it, right? Or you can just you know Google. NATO summit meetings and then you will see the list, right? Okay, no need to, you know, uh, have long discussion on, you know, what each of the summit meetings are, right? Uh, but you could take a look to, um, because there are some documents like, uh, if I remember correctly, I remember reading this, uh, there's an attachment uh, that they have that describe what has been discussed in some of the various summit meetings before. So what you can do, right, is to take a look at the themes, all right? You know, what is it that they generally tend to meet do you understand the logic, right? So there can be, uh, you know, different themes like, you know, generally looking at maybe the last 10 years worth of summits, right? Uh, you know, this is generally what they, what prompts them to convene, what prompts them to convene and discuss, right? Okay, so that is what you could use, right? When you are discussing, uh, you know, the summit, okay? All right, this one is, you know, just a, a structure, of the, uh, you know, how, how does the internal working structure look like, right? Uh, you know, where does the Secretary General and the working staff, they sit in the council, then you've got a military committee, and then you've got the various, you know, sub-organizations, uh, you know, there. So, <clears throat> you know, good to know, right? Usually, I would say this, you know, very few exam answers require you to discuss this in detail, right? Because, like I always say, don't put in something, you know, for the sake of putting in, uh, you know, the, the detail, not relevant, you know, forego it, you know, write, you know, about the, the mission or write about the ideas, you know, uh, uh, the logic, you know, that we've explained and so on. Those are actually more relevant, right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, right? So just, like I said, good to know, right? But, but please make sure at least you know, you know, the name of the Secretary General, right? Uh, yeah, Jen Stoltenberg, right? I knew it was, you know, Stol Stolzberg or Stoltenberg or something like that. Jen Stoltenberg, current, uh, you know, uh, Secretary General, till 2022. I do not know until 2022 when specifically, right? So, like I said, uh, okay, logic is this. If you are unable to check or you've forgotten to check, right, whether there's an update, then what you can refer to, right, is like put in the timeline. So, you can say that, you know, uh, you know, Jen Stoltenberg, you know, was... The Secretary General from this period to this period, right? You get what I mean, huh? Okay, all right. So that that is that will be a way for you to write an answer uh, that you know um, it's not actually inaccurate because you know maybe it has shift changed, but you were referring to a specific time period, so you're not, you're not wrong in that sense, right? That's why I say that you know the timelines are important. Okay, so decisions taken at the summit level, right? They are issued uh, in declarations and communiques. Right, which are then uh, which are public documents, right? That explain the alliance's decision and reaffirm allies' support for you know aspects of NATO's policies, right? So what you want to highlight is that the decisions taken, right? Remember what we always say in an IO, 
right? Uh, you know, you have got the vision, you've got the, you know, the, the large mandate, you've got the policy decisions that are taken at, you know, uh, the higher, you know, level of decision making, like by the ambassadors or the, 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 uh, heads of state and so on who are members, right? Then they get translated into tangible, workable policies by the staff, right? So what you want to highlight is that decisions are then translated into action by the relevant actors, like what you saw under the different departments. Remember just on the structure you saw? The, 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 the flowchart, right? It gets translated <coughs> by the relevant actors <coughs> according to the area of competency and responsibility okay all right and then uh remember highlight highlight that logic uh? uh decisions are made in consensus basis right so again you know uh, all these questions you know that uh, ask you in the exam right you could get a generic question to ask you in the exam right do you agree with the logic that international organizations basically rob states of their sovereignty very common exam question angle, particularly for EU. But this is a common understanding, right, of international organizations in general, right? By being a member of an international organization, right, does it mean that a state gives up its sovereignty and openly, you know, willingly invites interference, intervention into its domestic affairs? Right, this is a common angle. This is a common query in IR. At what point, you know, because sovereignty is a big issue, right? You know, states are supreme actors, you know, in their own territory, uh, you know, and they all function in an anarchic international environment and their behavior is structured by institutions, right? So there's no supreme authority. So what, what, is, what is next? There's no global government, but there's global governance. Organizations like NATO, UN, and so on are part of this global governance network. Right? Then the next question is, do any of these organizations impinge, infringe, affect levels of sovereignty of the state? So how do you answer these kinds of questions? Yes, they impinge. No, they don't. If you say no, they don't, then you need to explain. These are examples, illustrations of organizations right, that require decision-making on consensus basis. So even questions like on the EU, you know, they ask you, you know, oh, giving uh, states have to give up their sovereignty in order to be part of the EU, right? Is that really true or not? If you are, you know, signing the treaty and you, you know, are making decisions via consensus basis, basis by the European Parliament, then can you really say that it's negatively impacted and affected your sovereignty? Same thing down here, right? So which organizations, this is the, these are the open-ended type of questions, the application questions, right? So, if you know, you could use NATO as an illustration for that type of question. Why you say no, right? Because decisions are make, made on a consensus basis. Because you know, it, it you know, if you look at the idea of sovereignty, right? Sovereignty is about defending your territory. An organization that you know has to do with collective security goes towards you know, uh, helping to defend your territory, even, right? So what what do you understand by the meaning of sovereign? What do you understand by the meaning of sovereignty, right? And how does it get impacted, right, by international organizations? It it, it is an extension of the discussion, but you could use it as an example. Also, the logic is this, right? Think about, you know, um, the different ways you can use the organizations that we are studying, the different chapters, right, to answer a variety of questions. It's not always about one question based on one organization. What can I pull from where? Let me say it's a holistic approach, all right? You need to have a holistic approach also, right? This is what I've been telling you from just now, okay? All right, okay, so... Um, you know, it has, and, and when you talk about consensus basis, then, right, you want to discuss what are the problems with making decisions on a consensus basis. So on one hand, right, you know, you have that sovereignty argument, right? Then on the other hand, you know, of course, you know, when you talk, we talk about making decisions on consensus basis, right, what's the problem with it? It complicates decision-making process. If you cannot come to an agreement, right, then you will find that, you know, decisions become long-drawn. Can you afford for protracted decision-making when it comes to security issues, right? Uh, that is the other, you know, angle. So there are different ways to look at it. Which direction do you want to bring the argument to, right? Okay, but the logic is that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, whether it is, you know, complicates the decision-making process, whether it impacts on the, you know, image of NATO being efficient or not, right? The logic remains, 
right, that you have a legitimization of NATO policies because, you know, whatever decisions, right, you know what we mentioned, right, the decisions, uh, you know, uh, then subsequently issued in declarations, communicates, uh, it's translated into action. It doesn't, it, it, it's not a scenario where these decisions are plucked out of nowhere, right, they have no basis, none of the states agree and they're being forced to do so. So there's a legitimization, right, of the policies that NATO basically comes up with, right. So underline that word legitimizing, right, and uh, it legitimizes, this is phrase here, it has legitimized NATO's policies as expressions of the collective will. If you talk about security community, you talk about collective regime, uh, sorry, collective security regime, you talk about defense architecture, then you want to include that logic. The, you know, the, the consensus ba the, sorry, the consensus based decision making, right, legitimizes the um the logic of uh, you know uh, uh, you know NATO's actions and is an expression of the collective security regime. Okay, all right. So no no point just you know dumping in the word collective security. How does it get translated? You no, know, it's just a large concept, right? So how does it get trans? How does this logic of collective security right get translated into tangible, actionable, workable policies? It's an expression. Okay, all right. Then your North Atlantic Council, chaired by your NATO uh, Secretary General, all right, uh, Stol uh, uh, Jens Stoltenberg. Right, please spell correctly. All right, uh, the number of people who mangle people's names and mangle, mangle spelling of things like sovereignty. Please, uh, don't. I, I I've seen it. You know, I like literally vomit in my mouth a little bit when I when I you know read things like this. Right, it was things like sovereignty. Or you know, uh, theorist names, Kant's means and styles get spelled you know differently. I, I don't know how you know this happens, right? But please, you know, don't 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 make these kinds of of mistakes. And please try your level best to write in grammatically sound English, right? I, try. I mean, I'm not saying that it has to be perfect. It doesn't have to be flowery or whatever. But you know, try to you know have nice structure and good language. Okay. All right. Uh, and no informal language, uh, informal you know expressions, uh, please. All right. Uh, I've seen people you know write like things, you know like as if they're writing on a blog, right? Uh, you know it is a, a formal exam. Okay. All right. So uh, keep that in mind. <coughs> okay. Uh, and uh, the secretary general, right, is basically considered to be top international uh, civil servant. You'll notice most uh, statements, right, that are made uh, by NATO will generally be made by Jen Stoltenberg. Right, you know, it's really the face of the organization, right? Uh, you know, very uh, responsible for steering the process of consultation, decision making, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> that is why I say that it's important to make sure that you get his name correct. Number one, number two, uh, if there's a change in leadership, you also have to mention it because they're basically the face of the organization. Just like you know, in ICC, the face of the organization is who Fatu Ben Suda, which is the chief. Uh, international prosecutor. So certain organizations you definitely you know want to highlight, right? Uh, you know who are the main movers and the shakers. Same like you know when you talked about uh, World Bank, right? You Jim Kim Yong, right? Uh, you know that marked a, a change in the way the organization is run. So certain organizations you really got to pay attention uh, to the faces in the organization because you want to push a particular argument. Okay. All right, then you've got different kinds of committees and then you've got the parliamentary assembly, all right? Uh, what you want to highlight with the parliamentary assembly, right, is that it is an inter-parliamentary organisation. So this is where you get the representation, number one, of the member states, number two, right, the connection, right, between the organisation and the domestic uh, structures, all right, of the, the states, okay? <clears throat> and then... What you want to highlight uh, is that, you know, it is, you know, why do they want to have that, that connection, that ratification? Because you want to have support of the alliance policies, right? And then what you also want to highlight that, it, you know, it has actually uh, developed closer relationships with states that are outside, right, the, the you know, the, the traditional notion of what, uh, you know, um, the, the member states that you know, NATO used to cover, right? So it's no longer just the North Atlantic. So you've got close relations with political leaders from Central Eastern Europe as well as Middle East and North Africa. Please highlight that one. The, the, this one, the, the, the italicized, italicized point about since 1980s, right? You know, how it has expanded, uh, you know, having relations with other states. So that will go towards an argument that says that, yes, it may still be called North Atlantic, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, treaty organization, right? But 
uh, you know, that it, it has recalibrated. Remember that I used that phrase, that recalibration, right? Uh, and now, you know, the outreach, right? You know, and it makes it truly an international organization, number one. Number two, it explains why it is still relevant, right? Because you can't just, you know, go about repeating that, oh, it's relevant, it's accepted new, more members, right? But, and, and it's not something that is new either. It's from the 1980s, right? So it's not just a sudden, you know, turn around and say, okay, I want to have more members, right? But it is really about cultivating these relationships on a longer period of time, right? So that is why, again, the timeline, right, or, or, or the, the, you know, the, the date, right, is important to include, Okay. Right. For uh, the assembly, what it focuses on is your security and policy issues. Right. Uh, it is independent of NATO, but it provides a link between NATO and the parliaments of its member countries. So this is what I highlighted to you: the connection, right, the ratification, right, and it helps to build the public consensus. Right. So the logic, you know, the public consensus, the decision making. Right. It is not something that is driven by a few key figureheads. Right. Who are disconnected from the realities on the ground. Right, that's important because some of the organizations that we've talked about, when we critique the organization, we say that there's a disconnect, right? So you want to highlight the difference. So this is where, you know, sometimes I point out to you, uh, you know, some uh, arguments that you craft in, you know, in this course, right? You can, you know, very kind of like cleanly lean towards, yeah, I do not think that this organization uh, is very effective uh, actor <clears throat> on the international platform. Other organizations, there's a lot more for you to push it in that angle to have a more positive take uh, to it, or uh, you know, you don't have to resort to a kinder, gentler view, you know, by you know, overreach or stretching the point, right? And this would be you know, one of those organizations where there are a lot of evidence, right? <coughs> we can which you can point in this direction. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> then you've got the military committee. Just now it was a parliamentary committee, right? <clears throat> then you've got the military committee, right? Uh, which basically you know, oversees the, the elaborated, the elaborate integrated uh, military structure, all right? Uh, please, you know, uh, highlight here that this military structure, right, was, um, was basically non-existent in the 1950s. All right, this this particular aspect was non-existent in the 1950s, right? Um, it you know was um, you know it was an alliance, right? The North Atlantic Council, right, was basically the only uh, instrumental, uh, sorry, institutional. The North Atlantic Council, right, was the only institutional expression of NATO at that time, right? So subsequently, you've got the development of the military committee, okay? Right, so in the 1950s, in the earlier days of establishing. NATO, right? Okay, uh, you know, the North Atlantic Council was like the key decision-making organ. So what you want to be able to explain, right, if you, you know, look at Kant's means and styles uh, or some of these, uh, you know, um, uh, articles <clears throat> on the NATO website itself, they talk about the structure and the decision-making process, right? They will show you an evolution, right, of how, you know, it has expanded, how it has, you know, taken on more responsibilities, the institutional development or the institutional evolution, right, of the, of the, uh, the organs within the organization itself, okay? All right? So, uh, just, you know, just highlight 1950s, right? Uh, basically, you know, um, you know, it was like a floating body without a HQ, right, in the initial days and the council, right, was the only uh, expression, right? Right now, we've got several of these different committees, right, that help to streamline the work, right, and, uh, you know, make it more focused, right, on particular areas because you've got the different, you know, subcommittees that now take responsibility for translating this broad vision and the goals, right, into tangible, actionable, workable policies, okay? <coughs> So this is what, you know, NATO is, uh, you know, today, right? Okay, so that's why I concluded, you know, at the end of, uh, you know, this slide down here, right? You know, earlier on in its inception, right? It was, you know, really, you know, very little, much, no, not much more, right, than a collective security regime. So that's why you want to, you know, alongside <clears throat> your discussion of why it has remained relevant, right? The logic is this. You cannot say that it is not relevant anymore if you've got such intense institutional development correct so that goes towards an argument right if it's if it, if, if it if today as what you see right it still is like you know the floating body 
right? Without uh, a HQ, if it is still, you know, <clears throat> uh, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't have bureaucratic uh, apparatus, it even if it doesn't have all of these different military committees, uh, sorry, if it doesn't have all of these different committees like the military committee or the parliamentary uh, body and so on, right? Then you could say, yeah, you know, it's not entirely relevant anymore because it is just you know, uh, an expression of collective security where, you know, members can come and go and make this and, and you know, engage in decision-making. But that's not the case. The decision-making, right, is institutionalized, right? Okay, so that is the angle, you know, that you want to uh, highlight, right? So that goes towards, you know, talking about how relevant it is today, okay? <coughs> Why the slide? Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, in 1952, right, that is when it actually crystallized Right as uh, you know, an, an established you know international uh, organization, right? Uh, and this is the where you get the dual nature. Remember the dual institutional nature or the two prong that I talked about. So if, I, if you didn't talk about that, right, at the beginning, you know, uh, you know of your exam answer to say, you know, when you talk about the background of NATO, or you provide the overview. If you didn't include that part in your discussion, right? Then how do you make this argument down here? You understand the logic, right? Unless you are going to write an answer that is structured in a very traditional manner. That means, you know, your very old school type of answer where you start off like, this is the history of the organization, blah, 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 right? And then, you know, then you go on to the analysis. You can do that, but the danger of doing that is that some of the points that you write may be then irrelevant, right? Because you start off with the history, the historical overview, right? How much of that is directly relevant to the question? Right? How are you phrasing it? Right? So that is what I need you to think about. My, the, the way I'm suggesting that you write the answer is based on my understanding right, of what is required for the question. It doesn't mean that you have to follow the exact same style that I'm you know, mentioning. I'm just giving you an idea about the different ways you can approach the question, which I think would work. If I was taking the exam, that was how I would write the answer. You understand the logic down here? You are free to modify it. But make sure that you modify it in such a way that it actually answers the question. Right? I'm not saying that my method or the way I'm describing things is the best way or the only way. I'm not forcing you to do it in that way. Right? You have the liberty to adjust it, but make sure that you answer the question. Okay? All right. So, you know, I'm just thinking about logic. Uh, you know, okay, you know, it's a logical way to structure it. Okay? So, you know, um, the logic is that, you know, only after the dual nature, right, then you can, you know, can you really firmly establish it as an international organization, a full-fledged I.O. Prior to that, right, uh, you know, that means an interim period about 49 to about 52, right, you know, uh, it is still in the process of establishing itself, okay? Now comes to the institutional effects, right? Okay, <clears throat> so this is the part, can you write down there at the beginning of this slide down here, all right? This is the part that is important, especially when you talk about, right, the relevance, that means any question, right, that you, that ask you to explain, you know, the relevance of the organization, number one, number two, the effectiveness of the, of the organization. Number three, if you want to continue to talk about why, right, a defense architecture is necessary in the region, right, because you have a reimagined Russian threat. All of these kinds of questions, right, would need you to basically refer to literally all of the points in this section of the uh, topic. Okay? All right, the effects here. All right, this is where you talk about the reimagined uh, Russian threat. Okay? All right. So what you want to uh, explain, right, that, you know, uh, is that <coughs> the collective de defense security, uh, sorry, the collective defense structure, right, uh, you know, in the, in, you know, during the Cold War period, right, uh, you know, it had limited the members' flexibility, right, post-Cold War, right, that's why I told you, you know, that, that juncture is important to highlight, right. Post-Cold War, right, there is more flexibility with regards to specific missions, right? So what you want to explain, right, is that, you know, if in, in your exam answer, right, if you want to talk about contributions as an international organization, you have to look at the pre-Cold War and post-Cold War NATO. How does it change, right? Because, you know, how does it understand the threat, okay? All right, so, you know, and go back, you know, to the original logic, what is, the, what is the original tagline that is associated with NATO? The original tagline that everybody you know, refers to when they talk about NATO. What's the original tagline? Like a slogan that you should include. NATO was designed to... Um, 
NATO was designed to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Americans in, Russians out, and Germans down. Keeping the Russians out, right, is that still relevant today? Keeping the Americans in, is that still relevant today? Right? Right, Germany, okay, la, you know, we don't really consider that, you know, as a big problem, right? But Russia, yes, right? Right? Huh? So that is where, it, you know, you continue to talk about, you know, that still exists, but in a different form. A different manifestation, right? Logic. See? Okay? Right, this is, this is the, you know, I tell you, you open any video, right, or you read anything on NATO, surely you will see, like, you know, any, any, any author or any video producer would insult, right, would include, you know, this, you know, snazzy tagline, you know, relating to NATO, right? So you will surely see this. Okay? All right. So, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you want to highlight post-Cold War period, right? This is where you see the enlarge uh, enlargement, enlargement, all right? Okay? When you talk about, you know, uh, you see, I've got the updates to NATO, right? Then my notes, uh, I've got, you know what, all accordion, you know, sets of notes because I've handwritten everything for you. So the logic is this, right? Post-Cold War, 1990s, right? Where, you know, you talk about um, that the criticism is that, that is leveled by critiques, observers. I like to use the word observer. I think, you know, observer is actually a more neutral term to talk about, you know, uh, or analysts, right? I, I'd rather use analysts rather than say critic, right? No, critics of NATO. If you want to write with critics of NATO, then you better be talking only about criticism, right? But if you say observers or analysts, then that's a more neutral term that you can use and say that, okay, this is how they understand developments in NATO. So choose your terminology uh, carefully, right? Uh, so, you know, early 1990s, right? There was, uh, you know, uh, criticisms or, or accusations of enlargement, right? And mission creep inside, outside of Europe. Right, and therefore you see, you know, this is the turning point. This is where NATO starts to shift, right? And the rationale that is given uh, for the enlargement, right, is that the values. Remember, just now we talked about, you know, all the values that is at the heart of NATO. Remember, I talked about it, the hardware, right, and the creation of the security community, right? Okay. Now the rationale is that these values are not something that is, uh, you know, can only be restricted to say states in Western Europe, for instance. Right? This is not something that, you know, uh, it's not applicable to others, right? So the rationale, right? You know, whatever that helped NATO to get the, you know, so far, hitherto, right? That's, you know, the meaning of that, right? Uh, democracy, rule of law, individual liberties, you know, uh, you know, you could add on if you'd like European identity, right? Uh, or collective security, you know, any of these ideas, right? Were key, was, was key to lasting peace and security in the region. So what you want to do is that if you want stability, Right, then you want to extend right the sphere of influence. Remember, like you know how we use the word sphere of influence, right? You want to extend this region, right, or the zone of peace outwards, right? Because if, if it has worked this long, right, then you want to extend the zone of peace outwards, right, or eastwards, right, and to basically you know help to uh, you know uh, accommodate right these Eastern European states that are now coming out of the Soviet Union's you know uh, shadow. Right, so you are looking at how do we, you know, make the entire region more peaceable in nature, right? As a result of these changes, so you can't just say that oh, you know, they've accepted more members because the configuration of what the region is all about now has shifted, right? So the organization is rightly so responding to changes in the region also. So, you know, all the criticisms that, oh, it's engaged in mission creep, it's enlarging itself, it's biting off more than, you know, it's supposed to bite off. Is that founded? Is, is, it, is it baseless? Is it unfounded criticism? Right? Or is it, you know, a natural reaction of the organization which has been committed to peace of the region? And now, you know, the configuration of the region or the demographics, right, or, you know, the uh, what I like to, you know, use the political and policy context in which it operates. That means the environment in which it operates now has undergone changes. And therefore, right, the organization needs to respond, right? Logic is this. When organizations don't respond to changes, they say organization stagnant, static, inertia, resistance to change. When the organization responds to changes, mission creep. You understand the rationale now. It's taken, or it's always taken as an extreme. What what a thinking student should do is to look at 
the context that it operates in. The, how has this context changed? Can I use this context to uh, explain? This is why it still remains relevant today. You understand the rationale or not? The, can you please write down there the policy or political context or <coughs> policy and political environment, right? This would be a useful phrase. You know, in, you know I, I, I use this now when I want to talk about, you know, uh, usually I tend to use this when I want to talk about uh, country-specific factors, right? So this is why a state responds or this is why policy looks like in a state, right? Uh, because these particular country specific factors. So why does Singapore respond <coughs> to uh, developments in the region, right? You know, uh, in a particular way. Why does it respond to Malaysia in a particular way? Why is it insistent on having all the details despite, despite you know, the, the, the new variant and so on, right? So, you know, what is the policy and political context, right? The vulnerabilities, you know, the, the need for the economy to grow, blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing, right? So I usually use it in a domestic sense, but increasingly I find that is something, it's a useful idea or concept to apply, right, you know, when you're looking at things on a global level also, right? So, you know, looking at the region, especially these kind of organizations which are, you know, concentrated in a particular region, they have a particular kind of membership, right? So this is how you want to, you know, describe it. Also things like, you know, say for example, uh, the pandemic is another example, right? So what is the political and policy context in which all of us are operating right now, right, in a, you know, pandemic era or Okay, I wanted to say post-pandemic era, but I think cannot say that right now, right? So, <laughs> pandemic era, in, in this era, right? Uh, so, this is, you know, how the environment structures the response, right? So, that is a useful phrase, right, to use. Keep this in mind, please, right? Because it could be a useful, you know, way to justify some of your exam answers. Of course, please do not, you know, say, uh, attribute everything to political and policy context to say, uh, like that, lah, you know, because environment is like that. Therefore, uh, no choice the organization responds in like that. You know, that policy and political context should not be used as an excuse for ineffectiveness, for real inertia, for not responding to a particular issue or for continuing, uh, you know, to, to respond to issues in the same manner, like, you know, how World Bank and IMF continue to have the same structural adjustment programs but couched in a different language, right? You know, they, they claim that they've changed it, but, you know, changes are cosmetic. So, of course, you know, the, poli the policy and political context or the policy and political environment should not be used as an excuse for ineffectiveness, right? But it is used as a way to justify uh, why is something still relevant, why have changes occurred, and so on. You understand? How to use this uh, concept? Everybody clear on this one? Anybody needs me to explain again? Okay, right? Can I? Yeah. Okay. Right. I, I tell you, you know, in, if you write, you know, in this way, right? I'm quite sure, you know, the marker will be appreciative of the fact that you're not just regurgitating because you see the logic is this, huh? Online exam, open book, right? You do have a high instance, right, of the number of students who will likely revert to notes and the, the textbook and so on, and basically reproduce, right? So you want to any? Oh, okay. So maybe maybe they're just checking whether the room is cold or not. They can feel the draft, right? Because I talked about it just now. Uh, um, so so the logic is that you know when you start to uh, you know have more analytical answers, right? That really are application style, right? Uh, you may have a better chance of you know your answers being more outstanding than other candidates. Okay, all right. Okay. So uh, did I finish this slide? Yeah, I did finish this slide. Okay. <coughs> Okay, here, all right. Of course, you know, uh, you know the persistence and the persistence and the attempt to, you know, uh, enlarge, you know, enlarge itself, right? Is of course not, you know, uh, you know, without any, uh, you know, criticisms or not without any issues, right? And what they also, what you also want to do is sometimes, uh, you may get a question that asks you to compare NATO, right, with OSCE, right? But very, quite, quite rare. Right, uh, that kind of questions for comparison with OSCE is quite rare, right? Uh, but you know, uh, just just think about you know uh, it when we look at next week's topic, right? Uh, you know, think about how what are the different issue areas where you can make a comparison to OSCE. I don't want to go into that right now. Only after you see OSCE, then you can see whether you can make any comparisons or not, right? Uh, but the logic here, right, is that you know. Uh, you know, you had several new Eastern European members that were taken on, like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Croatia, right, under Partnership for Peace, right? Uh, but, you know, you did not see this enhanced uh, security vision or enhanced, uh, sorry, new security vision or enhanced military capabilities. But what you see, so 
subsequently when you have the collapse of the Iron Curtain, collapse of the, uh, of the Soviet Union, right? The logic is that what is critical to this new political policy context? You have a collapse of a major power. Because remember just now, we talked about the polarity, right? That was why I wanted to talk about the polarity. So you have a major change, right, in the distribution of power in the international system, right? So what you need to do, if you have a major change, a shake-up, then you need to ensure that the system remains stable, international system remains stable, right? So that is why there is a need, right, to protect European stability in the face of this changing polarity. Right, so that's the important. That's why I mentioned the idea of the, you know, the configuration, uh, the distribution of power. Right. So what happens is that you know when you have this dissolution, what are the the things that you're going to expect to see, or what? Oh, you know, basically, what did you actually see? Right. So you've got instability cropping up in the various regions. Uh, sorry, in the various, uh, you know, states, you know, uh, of. Uh, who were formerly under the Soviet Union's shadow, right? So you've got, you know, outbreak of civil war, you've got refugee crisis and so on. So can NATO just sit down and say, sorry, this is outside of my, you know, the North Atlantic. I cannot touch any of this. Cannot, right? The logic. So if, if you require NATO then, then why are we making this criticism and saying it's irrelevant and, you know, the Soviet threat doesn't exist anymore and so on. So there are many different, you know, it's, it's almost like as if all of these authors, right, have cherry-picked their, you know, parts of this argument. But, you know, it appears, I mean, don't, 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 don't use this, this, this phrase in your exam answer, right? But, you know, it almost looks as if, you know, their justification for saying NATO doesn't, uh, you know, it's not relevant anymore. It's really based on the logic of what the name actually is, right? If you change the name, right, or if you change NATO's name to something, I don't know, something else, right? Like, you know, treat, I don't know, defense treaty or, you know. Um, but don't make suggestions for name change or so. Uh, right, but the logic is that, you know, that seems to be like a sticking point that leads people to cherry pick, or leads critics to cherry pick, right? And say, oh, you know, now it's no longer relevant anymore. But look, look at the developments. And you needed, you know, it then, right, to, you know, uh, assume the responsibility of restoring peace, right, in the, in the region as a result of this collapse, right? So that is why the, I talked about the polarity and important to talk about pre-Cold War, post-Cold War NATO. What are the activities? You don't show this distinction, right? You cannot make this argument. Okay, uh, and then you know uh, the different you know uh, uh, you know important or significant you know missions, right? Always have two or three missions, all right? Uh, that you can use as examples. Same thing if you're talking about UN peacekeeping, right? If you're talking about any of the security organizations, right? Always have. You don't have to have all. You don't need to have long story describing the missions either, <coughs> but make mention. You know, just drop it. You know, in a in a list form on a bracket. Right, say that okay, you know, ninety five. There's an implementation force to you know for peace agreement, Bosnia. You've got you know a campaign, right, of airstrikes and so on, right, and, and and so on. You know, and whether these have attracted you know positive uh, response or negative response, like the nineteen ninety one one, uh, you know, basically uh, did not attract you know positive response. It occurred without UN endorsement. Okay, all right. So these are the ways you know to uh, include the idea of the pre Cold War and the post Cold War NATO. Okay, here this one. Uh, this one is important, right? Please pay attention uh, to this argument. I'm, I'm going to... It's a bit small, so I'm going to close the chat for, the, for now. Okay, so you can see better. I think you have your notes with you, right? All right, yeah, okay. All right, so this one here, right, is when we start to talk about, uh, start to talk about Russia and Russia's response, right, uh, to NATO. So what, you know, uh, you want to highlight is that there have been two uh, committees, or, you know, two uh, sub-organizations that have been designed, right, to touch base uh, with Russia, right, and to create, you know, this relationship between NATO and Russia, right? So what you want to highlight is the perspective, right, that Russia has towards NATO versus the perspective that NATO has towards Russia and the attempts that it has made to engage Russia, right? That is what you want to highlight when you talk about the PJC, which is the Permanent Joint Council, and subsequently the NRC, which is the NATO-Russia Council, right? Okay, uh, this one is an important argument. Can you please put an asterisk on this slide here, All right? So that, uh, you know, when, when you begin to talk about, you know, the, the, the recalibration, right, of, the, of, of NATO's understanding or the, or the international you know, community's understanding of what 
uh, what kind of uh, threat that you know, Russia continues to pose, right? You would need to mention this, okay? And how, you know, despite attempts, right, uh, you know, to form or build, can you underline that? Build constructive relations with Russia. So NATO's attempt to build constructive relations here, this part here, since 1994, to build constructive relations with Russia, let me just underline that, right? That is the real function uh, behind, you know, these, um, you know, uh, councils, right? Okay, so, you know, basically you're looking at security between, uh, you know, NATO and Russian Federation, right? So you've got the PJC and the NRC. So the PJC uh, was actually replaced by the NRC in 2002, so, but that was the original one, okay? So, what you want to explain, right, is that, uh, number one, the important thing, right, is that you have got the, the 1997, right, uh, NATO-Russia Founding Act on Mutual Relations, Cooperation and Security. So, there's an act that actually, you know, is the, the formal basis of any kind of engagement between NATO and Russia, right? Okay, so that's one thing you want to highlight. What you want to highlight is the perspectives, right? Okay, so what, you know, the West, you know, saw... Uh, you know, the PJC as a way, right, to engage NATO construct uh, sorry, engage Russia constructively, all right? The West saw PJC as a way, an avenue, extending an olive branch, right? Uh, it's a way to engage NATO, uh, uh, engage Russia constructively, sorry, right? Uh, you know, influence military reform uh, on Russia's part, right? And, you know, uh, influence their perceptions of what NATO actually represents and what it is. Russia looks at it in a different way, right? They see it with a high level of suspicion, right? So what they see it, right, as, a, I like this phrase here, can you please underline this one? An institutionalized means of limiting the impact of NATO enlargement, right, and ensuring Russian influence on NATO policy, right? Okay? So what you then see, right, is you have a replacement of the PJC, right, uh, in 2002, right, and what and, and you have a new act, right, uh, uh, which is the 2002 Rome Declaration on NATO-Russia relations, right, and the original act, the 1997 act, right, which forms the basis of the engagement between uh, Russia and NATO, right, remains as it is, but you know the new act 2002 it builds on it. Right, so that's why we talk about it as being institutionalized, right? Okay, so uh, the purpose, you know, is to ensure that you have got, you know, a relationship that exists between NATO and Russia. So the rationale, right, is that they have consistently attempted to engage in consultation, right? So there's an institutionalized, I like this phrase, you know, maybe I'm going to write it down or, you know, highlight it, it's, it's here, it's like the institutionalized mechanism. I think I use the word mechanism, right? You know, it... it you know, it gives you the idea that, you know, it is a traditional way of outreach, right? It, uh, it's got, you know, uh, a juridical basis, right? Uh, you know, it's something that is, re you know, reverted to consistently, right? It is, you know, there's a, you know, it, there's an act that, you know, underscores, right? Uh, you know, the engagement, right? So the institutionalized mechanism, very nice, good phrase to use, okay? All right. So it's a mechanism for consultation, consensus building, cooperation, joint decision, joint action, right? You know, where you would see the NATO member states and Russia actually working together as partners. So in an ideal situation, that is technically how, you know, Russia, uh, NATO would like Russia to engage with them, right? So, you know, that, that is the basis for it, right? Okay. And the rationale here, right, uh, you know, is that, you know, this was, uh, you know, a departure from the PJC. That's why they had an update, right? Previously, you used to have, you know, NATO plus one format, right? Now, you know, that was under what, what you saw in the PJC. Now, you really see, um, you know, the member states uh, of NATO and Russia meeting, you know, on a, on, on a regular basis, right? Uh, on a more equal basis rather than, you know, NATO plus one and then and then Russia, right? Okay, but what happens, right, is that um, this engagement gets suspended, right? Uh, you know, um, following the military intervention in Ukraine in 2014, right? And then subsequently, uh, the engagement has, you know, been suspended uh, every time, you know, Russia starts, you know, act, 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 acting up, you know especially around Thanksgiving time, right? They have, uh, you know, and uh, the rationale is that, you know, they want to, you know, con you know use this as a, a way or an avenue, right, to engage, you know, uh, you know, with Russia uh, using, you know, political dialogue that's meaningful, true sphere of liberalism, right? 
you know, you want to engage in, uh, you know, dialogue, you want to reduce confrontation. But how do you, you know, uh, continue to do so when there is, you know, an overt action by uh, Russia, right, in, uh, you know, contravening the principles, right, of, you know, stability, peace, right, non-intervention, right, which is what basically NATO stands for, right, okay? Okay, so that is, you know, what you want to highlight. So the NRC, the PGC and the NRC are actually, uh, you know, relevant to the discussion when you want to talk about, you know, the attempts by NATO to engage Russia, right, to mitigate, 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 very nice word to use also in these kinds of arguments, mitigate, right, that means to reduce the negative effect, right? A lot of these, you know, uh, keywords, right, will go towards convincing the marker of the point that you're trying to make, right, okay? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to open up the thing again. Hold on, huh? so that I can see the chat. Okay, so the logic here, right, is that you know Russia continues to see NATO as an anti-Russian military alliance, right? Unfortunately, so still sees it, you know, with a high level of suspicion, right? You know, similar like you know to how it sees you know uh, EU, you know, with uh, you know high level of suspicion as well, right? But this one is actually you know quite uh, uh you know uh, you know consistent, right, okay, and, uh, you know, a couple of videos for you down there, you know, take a look at it, uh, you know, when you have time, not not very, uh, um, not very long, right, some of the videos are actually quite good, right, uh, and then, you know, what you see is that, you know, in, uh, an attempt, right, uh, you know, for Russia, attempt on Russia's part to consistently push back, right, okay, the resistance, right, so, you know, it consistently wants to, you know, uh, you know, seek to renew its influence abroad, it, you know, engages in, you know, things like cyber attacks, information operations, attempting to influence, you know, elections and so on. This is what, you know, we've been seeing, you know, in, in accusations against, you know, Russia's interference, like meddling, right, in, in, in elections and uh, the threat that it, it poses, it uh, poses, poses, not poses, the threat that it poses today, right, so, again, and I'll come back to the question, right? Do you see a dissipation of the Russian threat, right? Or rather, a reimagination of the Russian threat? A lot of students, right, cannot um, sometimes forget to, you know, they sort, sort of mention it, but they don't develop the argument strongly enough. That means you just say that, oh, yeah, today Russia, you know, engages in these cyber attacks, it engages in hacking, interference in elections, and so on. Come outright and say it develop the argument to say that this still presents, right, uh, a threat uh, to the rest of the states, right? So you cannot say that, uh, you know, just because the environment in which it operates, you know, it's no longer, uh, you know, like what you saw in the Cold War era as, you know, a major superpower, right? Just because that configuration doesn't exist anymore, it doesn't mean that the threat that it presents is any much lesser. You could say that, you know, it, okay, yeah, the threat is lesser, but it doesn't mean that the threat has uh, dissipated or disappeared altogether. That's what I meant to say, okay? All right? So here, what you want to start to talk about, right, is this, okay, sorry, I need to open this up again. Let me close this, all right? Okay, so what, what you know you want to highlight, uh, I think, Calling it a new Cold War is a bit of a stretch. Some critics and some observers, you know, have basically labelled it as such, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. It, it may be a little bit of a stretch, right? But what I want you to highlight here, the grey zone. Can you see the grey zone? All right. That is uh, an important way uh, and a good way to explain the the the, the reimagined uh, Russian threat, right? So you know, refer to it as the grey zone. Okay, all right. So what you want to you know uh, explain here, right, is that you know um, this this shadow conflict. All right. Hey, look at the phrasing. Huh? such shadow conflict wage below the threshold of combat. What does that suggest to you? All right, NATO is still functioning in a more traditional manner, right? Russia, right, is looking at, you know, manifesting in a slightly different way, right? So this is what they refer to as the grey zone, right? Okay, it makes it hard uh, or makes it difficult to say, hey, do, you know, did they really engage in this? It takes them, it takes a little while, you know, before they admit or, you know, they say that, oh, there's evidence of Russian interference in the American elections or in the UK elections or in the French elections and so on. Right. Okay. So that is the reason why you want to uh, highlight the logic of the grey zone. Number two. Right. Why is it important?
for an organization like NATO to continue to function. Because remember what we talked about earlier on about what NATO represents, the logic of stability, peace, right, democracy. You know, these are the pillars, the values that gel the security community together. Correct? Remember we mentioned this earlier on, right? If you do not have a gelled security community, if you do not have a cohesive European identity, a cohesive European community, if it is fragmented, right, then it will make it even easier, right, for Russia to engage in this acti tactics and its activities under the grey zone to infiltrate, to wreak havoc. You understand the rationale down here? Right? So that is why I made reference to the logic of the security community, made reference to the logic of the values that is at heart. Right? Why, you know, we can say that, yeah, you know, uh, you, even though it's taken on more new members, right, what is the value that, you know, holds this community together? Right? Whether you're Eastern European or Western European, if you subscribe to that value, you sign the treaty, the Article 5, Right, and remember that that idea where I explained the logic, you know, behind the Article Five. You know, I pulled it out just now, right? All that together helps you to explain this point, right? So, if you have a lack of consensus and division, it will make it easier for Russia to operate successfully in the grey zone, right? So, what happens is that you've got this. I, I like I like that phrase very much. Uh, you know, Michael Clark, right? Uh, who was a defense uh, professor, you know, labeled Russia. It's going to be a real nuisance. <coughs> Right for NATO in the next you know ten to twenty years. But before I go to China, right, let me just explain the logic of the gray zone. Right, okay. So what you know is this logic about the gray zone is that it is it's a reference to what they talk about. You know, when it, you may see this phrase, a digital playbook, digital di digital playbook. All right, okay, which basically refers to non-military means to achieve security goals. Right, so the missus is you know going beyond your traditional security means, right? Okay, so it draws on the digital playbook, right, which is what they refer to as the gray zone, right? So things like chemical grade weapons for assassinations, cyber attacks, right? Uh, you know, attacks on uh, uh, you know, uh, using energy coercion, right? Disinformation, election interference, election meddling, right? Okay. Military force in the Baltic or the North Atlantic regions, right? So anything, you know, like, you know, how, how do you trace things like, you know, your cyber attacks, right? Or the interference in elections and so on, right? So that is what we refer to as the grey zone, the digital playbook. So you just remember, when you, talk, when you say grey, like grey area, fuzzy, right? How do you easily attribute, right? In comparison to traditional means of attacks, right? Then when you look, you know, in, uh, then when you do this comparison, right? I, I like this, uh, you know, particular way of comparison, right? So if Russia is set to engage, right, uh, and, and, and operate according to this digital playbook, right, in the grey zone, to highlight NATO's traditional response, we say that NATO responds in an analog manner, right? So the analogy is a very nice analogy, very uh, analytical, in nature, right? Okay, so NATO tends to respond in analog approach via planning, command structure, troop deployment, long negotiations. Long negotiations, why? Because consensus faces decision making, right? Uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, they've got, you know, the military committee, right? And they've got, you know, the, you know, the troops on the ground and so on, right? Okay. So, therefore, you know, you cannot deny that the threat, you know, is not present anymore, right? It's very much present, right? And, then brings into brings in the question, is NATO well equipped enough, right, to respond to you know these non-conventional attacks, right? Keep this in mind because I want to you know bring this up again when I'm going to talk about you know the last point down here. Okay, so what happens is that uh, you know China right has also been identified right. Uh, where's my point on China? China has also been identified right as uh, uh, okay here. China has also been identified you know as a significant force against NATO right. Um, in some articles, in you know, in some instances, right. Okay, so uh, you know what happens with China, right? You know, just now Chinda was talking about you know China, China rising, right? Okay, so what you want to point out, right, is that um, with with China, what you want to describe expanding military posture of China in the Indo-Pacific, 
right? It's got a very assertive presence in Africa and Middle East as well, right? So that means we're not we're not labeling China as you know a direct threat, right? But these are the rising powers, you know, that need to be taken into consideration. Okay, economic technological footprint that threatens Europe's uh, industrial or you know uh, you know technological base, right? And then, as usual, which we've been seeing you know for a little while, growing power play, right, between Washington and Beijing, Europe caught in between. Right, and uh, you know, recently with you know the the the, the brouhaha over you know, Biden's uh, you know uh, response over Taiwan, right, and then you know China in the last couple of years, you know, uh, you know, um, the way they respond uh, to you know these kinds of developments in a more aggressive, more belligerent way, right, that is also a cause of concern, right. So you know, so far what you've seen is NATO has been engaging. Uh, in low-key dialogue and statements, right, uh, you know, of statements of concern. Usually that's how they describe it. Statements of concern, right, uh, you know, with reference to China and China's militarization in the South China Sea. That's, you know, uh, you know, of course, you know, a point of contention. So that's what you want to highlight about China down there, right? So what happens is that, you know, of course, no answer, right, that you discuss on, on NATO and Russia uh, is is uh, complete without talking about the annexation of Crimea, right? You know, and how you've got, you know, the 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 suspension of dialogue and engagement, right? So in December 2020, um, you know, they had, um, you know, while well, you had some drills, right, that was between, you know, these individual states, uh, member states, you know, and and uh, NATO, like member countries like US, UK, US, UK, Turkey, Pakistan. China and so on, right? Uh, you still see that this continued suspension, right? <clears throat> uh, you know of uh, cooperation between uh, you know Russia, uh, Russia and NATO, right? As a result of the annexation of Crimea, November twenty twenty one, brewing, right? So this one, this is the one that uh, can you put an asterisk on this? Write a note somewhere in your notes, right? To tell yourself to keep, uh, you know, to check for updates, all right? Because this is you know when I last checked over the weekend. This is, you know, what I have for you, all right? Subsequently, if, you know, uh, is, this, is this going to uh, turn into any other large-scale <coughs> um, uh, incident, all right? So that is what you want to highlight. So what you see down here, all right, is uh, there are concerns, right, that you may see a potential invasion, all right? Uh, you've got about 90,000 to about 100,000 troops, that have been deployed, right? Uh, and and Jen Stoltenberg has you know highlighted you know this in the common border, right? Uh, and and uh, what happens you know is that uh, Washington, uh, Britain, European allies are very concerned that there may be a potential you know invasion, right? So they are keeping a lookout for the situation. There's a uh, what they identified is about is is a <coughs> very large, unusual buildup of Russian forces, right? Uh, you know of tanks. Artillery, armored units, drones, electric warfare systems. This is all your digital playbook, right? Your drones, your electronic warfare systems, and so on, right? About ninety to hundred k, right? Uh, armed troops that are stationed in the region, right? So you know uh, there's been uh, concern, right? And uh, Jen Stoltenberg, you know, came out with a statement to say that Russia, please be forewarned that there will be costs. No, they actually use that word. There'll be cost to bear, right? You know, if you actually, uh, if this actually results in an invasion, right? So the rationale, the problem down here is that uh, this buildup is seen as unprovoked and unexplained. That suddenly, you know, this has occurred, right? So unprovoked, unexplained, it raises tensions and risks, right? And remember, just now I told you about how uh, NATO is seen to respond in analog time. Right, it's our analog approach versus the digital playbook of uh, Russia. Right? Okay. What you want to highlight is that Russia, uh, sorry, NATO has explicitly pointed out that if Russia suddenly, you know, shifts from this just stationing its troops and you know having all of this build up into an actual attack, NATO has already explained we will not have time to respond effectively to assist Ukraine. They've actually, you know, stated that there will be, you know, NATO will not have enough time to provide Ukraine with any substantial military uh, support should Russia 
backtrack on its initial claims because now you know when 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 this was occurring right russia keeps denying and saying no you know it's it's not we're not you know preparing for an attack so that's why you know there's a denial on russia's part of a potential uh, invasion right but nato has pointed out if they actually go ahead you know and backtrack on their denial nato will not have re- will not have time to respond right so that goes back remember just like to hold on to the argument about consensus decision making about the analog approach and so on right how does it respond uh, you know to development so this is the point that i want you to highlight okay all right so the reaction uh, you know by the washington britain european allies right okay this is an additional point i want you to think about right why is it that they are now concerned right just looking at the the the, the build up of the the military troops right and then they're saying that is you know unprovoked and so on right why are they so concerned right what can we attribute and attribute any theory or school of thought to this right okay so the rationale here is that you know they say russia has been known to be willing to use this type of military capabilities to conduct aggressive actions against ukraine that's the 2014 invasion the annexation of crimea right okay so therefore they need to be on guard what is this reflective of what is this reflective of if you say that you know we've seen russia do this before and therefore we need to be on guard there's a risk there you know it is something that's unprovoked you know uh you know and 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 out of nowhere it's occurred right but you know we are very concerned about it and we are warning them that's going to be a uh, 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 reparations or there's going to be cost where is this stemming from they say we know you know that you've done it before right you know uh we, that, that that's basically you know they've been no- known to use these type of aggra- uh, military capabilities to conduct aggressive action how can i make this argument analytical what can i attribute this to any theory any theory peoples huh realism okay fine yep constructivist in nature predispo remember the logic right remember the uk having nukes uh north korea having nukes which is seen to be more disturbing and you know uh, uh uh dangerous nukes are nukes right but the north korean nukes are seen to be more disturbing and a key is what states make of it the constructivist perspective based on historical uh you know activities that is why russia continues to remain a threat based on historical activities based on the preponderance to engage in such activities based on belligerent based on the logic of one of russia simple bring it down to this one point russia being a revisionist resurgent state right you heard of this phrase right revisionist resurgent right wanting to restore former glory wanting to establish sphere of influence right this is how you take this point which is from the media article you know use it translate it into something that is analytical in nature attach it yeah of course you know i do agree with the realist uh, you know response as well right because you know you see the build up right and then what 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 you basically see you see the build up uh, you know and that is perceived as being threatening it jeopardizes the peace i i can see where you came from with that but that is like if you build up in your own region in your own area like this is building up somewhere else in the border right which signifies that could this be uh, you know a signal of potential threat so that is why if i were to use it right i'm not saying that the realist uh, response is wrong uh, the, the response to use realism is wrong right but i would feel that you know the constructivist one takes it one step further you understand okay all right okay so you know sometimes you know we want to just you know uh, it's not that the answer is wrong but you know something is more correct you get what i mean okay all right <coughs> so oh sorry that that was the question sorry that was the question that i had at the bottom can you see the very small one what is this concern based on right that is where i added the analytical angle to it okay all right are we clear on this one okay okay 
So this one, the question about, you know, why is it relevant? Why does it persist, right? So a lot of this, you know, um, we've kind of already discussed already. So I'm going to, you know, just, uh, you know, summarize some of the ideas down here, right? So, you know, basically uh, what you have is, you know, the rational, uh, you know, from the realist perspective uh, and the liberalist perspective, right? So, you know, the realist and uh, the realists, you know, would say that, you know, NATO's expansion, right, is basically, uh, you know, to achieve relative gains against Russia. Remember, you know, the logic about how, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, I have to uh, win in, you know, at your expense, right? So that's the logic there. And then, uh, you know, the liberalist, you know, approach, you know, basically uh, would be to, you know, explain that it's a, a means to strengthen democracy, uh, the idea of the values, right, that we highlighted, the dialogue, the cooperation, right? So it is actually the same points, but I'm just, you know, attaching it to the different theories, right? And then, uh, you know, the significance of, uh, you know, NATO was actually called into question. This is uh, that common angle that, you know, I referred to, right? Why is it that, you know, NATO didn't disappear, right, you know, along with the disappearance of the Soviet Union threat, but we've just addressed it, right, in the previous slides. So your answer to that, what one part of that answer to that question is already addressed when we talked about the Russian threat. Second part, right, is the one that I talked about, you know, the Mekela argument, right, okay? So, you know, basically what he highlights is that, you know, when you talk about balance of threat, balance of power, or even realist approaches, remember what the realist approach tells you? That the states, right, will, and, you know, even, even if states are wearing their realist lenses, they will still engage in alliance building, right? And they'll engage in alliance building to the point where that mutual threat has actually been annihilated or, 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 or mitigated. And then once the threat no longer exists, right, the idea is that you do not, you will not necessarily see the alliance continuing to occur because states are operating on the basis that you cannot trust other states. Correct? The rational. Remember, we've talked about this before, right? Okay. So the rational is that, you know, uh, when states are wearing their realist lenses, uh, you know, you cannot rely on long-term alliance building, right? Okay, so that's the, you know, the rationale. So that's why you use that logic down there. The realists, right, would expect that, you know, the US would withdraw from NATO. You would see, you know, the implosion of NATO as well. It would not, you know, continue to remain relevant, right? Uh, it is, you know, costly. Of course, you know, collective security architecture is actually very costly, right, to maintain, right? So, you know, they would then, you know, pursue less uh, costly forms of, um, of uh, you know, the, the idea of... Uh, um, you know, these uh, uh, defense, you know, pursuit of defense and collective security, right? So, you know, if you do not have the uh, a Soviet Union threat, then the IO will basically die off, right? But if you've already proven Soviet Union threat still remains, right? And then now, you know, now we need to address this idea of the, the realist logic, right? Okay, okay. So, you know, basically, you know, what you want to highlight, right, is that point, you know, that I talked about, you know, the costly uh, idea, you know, the, the, the less costly idea of, um, of international security cooperation, right? So, basically, uh, what you want to highlight, right, is that, uh, you know, from the perspective of the U.S., right, commitment to European defense, right, at the time of the inception of NATO, right, and in the post-Cold War period, right, there was uh, a tendency by the U.S. to inform allies of change in policy only after decisions are made, okay, you know, rather, you know, uh, than prior consultation. So this has, you know, usually been, uh, you know, um, you know a, a source of tension, right, you know, that, you know, uh, has existed. So that's why you tended, you know, that the idea was that you would tend to see the slow withdrawal of the US, right, from the organization, okay? All right. But then, you know, let's look at this idea down here, right? Okay. You want to think about, you know, uh, you know how the there are different ways to explain the persistence of uh, NATO, right? Okay. So what you want to be able to explain, right, uh, is that, yeah, you know, uh, the rationale is that, you know, US may be frequently complaining, <clears throat> that, you know, the Europeans are paying, uh, you know, and doing too little to maintain their own defense capabilities, right? The accusation that, you know, uh, you know, the US, I mean, there was this calculation that, you know, Trump did, uh, you know, he called it obsolete in 2017, right? And then he continued to, you know, uh, discuss, you know, how it's not relevant anymore. Uh, you know, the, the US is paying like three quarters of the defense uh, expenditures, right? And, you know, other states like, you know, 
uh, Greece, UK, Estonia, you know, they're only the few that are meeting the obligations to pay, right? Uh, and they should pull up their socks and therefore, you know, it is not really, you know, a relevant organisation. But, you know, there are different, you know, ways to explain why it is persistent, right? So it had uh, developed a very strong organisational structure and organisational culture. This is an important point. Hans Mies and Stiles have got an elaboration of it. Please take a look at that. All right. Uh, what you want to explain, right, is that, you know, remember, remember the very uh, standard argument. Once institutions, right, formal institutions are created, right, they become sticky over time, right, because they're, repeated, they're repeatedly reinforced, right? But you also have this case where there are sunk costs involved, right? That means it becomes very, you know, you've already invested so much into it, right? And, you know, why do you want to destroy it? you know, uh, an organization where you've already invested so much into it, right? So that's where we talk about the sunk cost, right? That cannot be, recu uh, you know, recuperated. You cannot, you know, you know, take it back again, right? And the organization culture is that <clears throat> you have a recalibration of the expectations of the staff and the secretariat. They have an understanding of what the defense architecture, you know, actually refers to. What does it actually mean, all right? So what you want to highlight, right, is that, you know, at the end of the day, NATO came to play, you know, a lot of different roles, right, rather than just something that is simply that of a security alliance, okay? So this is the McKellar argument. So McKellar points out in his reading that the realists would say, right, that it should not be relevant anymore. How do we counter that argument? By referring to NATO, right, as a security community. So the identity that I talked about earlier on, this is the argument that you want to refer to, all right? <clears throat> you understand? Okay, so that means what you want to do, right, when you refer to this argument, you want to contrast, right, that realist perspective and the thought that NATO would have dissipated as a result of that realist idea towards alliance building, right, and the dissipation of the threat, and you take that and you contrast it with this argument down here. You understand? Clear? How to, how to fit it into the, the discussion? Okay? All right. <clears throat> so, Michaela, right, you know, explains this, right, in terms of the security community, right? So, in this case, right, what you see is that it has adapted. So, remember I told you about the, the adaptation the evolution of the organization, right, in response to the changes in the political and policy context, the environment, right? So that's what I mentioned earlier on, right? So it now, right, you know, uh, you know you're looking at it, you know, uh, in terms of, of, you know, as an IO per se, right? Okay, if, you know, if it fulfills, you know, it uh, fulfills all of these different, you know, uh, obligations, right, beyond the core defense function, right, then the less responsive it will be to changes in the threats it faces, and it will be transformed in purpose as the external environment changes. That means it evolves alongside the environment, right? So, you know, this also can borrow from the idea of constructivism because, you know, the idea that, you know, it, the actor, the actor, in this case, the actor, right? The actor's response evolves, changes alongside the environment, right? Okay, but I, I would like to use the security community, you know, instead, okay? So, what you highlight, right? NATO does, has had many, you know, uh, you know, not to say that every single mission is engaged in has been stellar or has been, you know, very successful. But despite that, you do not really see a scenario apart from the US whining about, you know, the the amount of money that is spent, right, and the other members not pulling up, you know, its weight, right. You will find that, you know, the member states generally have remained stuck to the organization, right. So what does it contribute to? If the members are not, look at League of Nations, members withdrew, right. But if you look at, you know, the United Nations, right, you do not have the case. You have more and more members, despite all the criticisms of it being Spaghetti Junction and so on, right? You have members who are continuing to remain. Why? Because there's an expanding reservoir of trust. They understand the relevance, the value, the function of the organization. And remember, even if you go with the realist idea, if the organization is a sum or an expression of, you know, what the members are, then the very fact that they continue to trust that this is going to function as a collective security organization, a defense architecture contributes to this argument. Okay? All right? Okay. So <clears throat> the rationale here, right, is that, you know, it's an achievement and a reaffirmation of NATO as a valid actor, right, because you see this institutional resilience. So in order to explain the security community and the institutional resilience, 
I would have needed to talk about what I mentioned just now about the organizational culture and the organizational structure, right? In the previous slide, you saw just now that I talked about it, right? And how, you know, uh, you know there's an internal uh, evolution, uh, you know, alongside the changes and then you've got the staff who continue to find it relevant, right? Want to keep it afloat. Your institutions, once created, become sticky and so on. If I had mentioned that, then I can make this argument very easily. So there's a connected uh, discussion, okay? <clears throat> okay, all right. And, you know, of course, you know, the, the, the challenge, right, is really, you know, this rationale about, you know, uh, you know it, it has, you know, veered away from the original sphere of influence, right, okay? So what happened is that, you know, you start to see uh, different missions in or different activities, you know, over the years, right, uh, where you've got NATO getting involved in the true spirit of what is understood as defense today. So the counter-terrorist or the anti-terrorist activities, right? So the 2003, under the UN mandate, they attempted to uh, have the peace restoration, you know, outside, uh, that is definitely outside, you know, the auspices of Europe. Uh, following 9-11, right, you've got, you know, uh, the members, NATO members you know, expressing uh, solidarity with the US, right? And then you've got, you know, several of these, um, several of these operations, you know, tend to be seen, uh, you know, as controversial, right? And, you know, some argue like, you know, do you really want to extend, you know, your sphere of activities, you know, that far, right? But what you want to be able to highlight, right, <clears throat> is that, you know, there is a consistency in the way uh, NATO has, uh, you know, uh, explained this evolution, right? So, you know, there's a change in what NATO stands for, right? Last six decades, basically, it has morphed, right? So that word there is a good word to use. It has morphed, metamorphosized, you can say. It has evolved, right? Just to, you know, you know highlight the logic of change, right? So, you know, it has moved from being a European military organization, right? to an international peacekeeping organization, right? So that is what you want to highlight. It's no longer simply something that is, you know, designed only for security in the European region, okay? So the logic, you know, what you want to emphasize, right, you know, uh, is that, you know, when the members believe that the international organization is legitimate, right, when they invest confidence in the mandate, they continue to rely upon it, right, then the I.O. becomes further institutionalized, right? So now when it engages in all of these missions, like, yeah, okay, you know, for example, uh, the Libyan one was a bit of a problematic issue, right? Because only eight out of the 28 allies, basically, at that point, right, conducted strikes over Libya, right? Uh, Germany actually even withdrew uh, its uh, crew or the troops from NATO, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, they you know, it was basically, you know, considered to be uh, explained as a war of choice, right? So what happened was, you know, you had uh, different states, different allies you know, of, the, of NATO, basically, you know, uh, saying that, okay, this is not in alignment, you know, with, uh, you know, our history, geography, interests, right? This can disrupt missions, true, right? But it doesn't occur in every single mission. It doesn't occur in every single activity, right? It depends on, you know, what is it that they're getting involved in also. So, you, your example or your argument should, you know, have a balance, right? You know, acknowledge that, yes, there are some that are controversial. There are some that the allies don't agree on they, and therefore they withdraw because remember it's a consensus base, right? So they don't agree on, they withdraw and so on. But generally, what you do see, right, is this investment, right, in the part of the members, you know, in, uh, you know, the, the continued reliance on NATO, right? So that is what you want to, you know, uh, argue, Okay. All right, so the rationale down here, right, is to, you know, point out, okay, you know, how can NATO basically evolve, right? So remember, that's not, you know, I, I told you, uh, you know, maybe change, you know, the name, right? That would be one way, uh, you know, to address all of these, you know, problems, right? Uh, you know, and I wouldn't say that, you know, NATO should actually shrink back to its original mission because, you know, that wouldn't make sense anymore, right? But, you know, become, you know, the, the name, you know, Atlantic, right? It's the one that, you know, it's an, an anomaly. So the suggestion by a lot of observers or analysts would say, maybe what NATO actually needs, right, is a rebranding, Right, a recalibration. Uh, you know, since it has recalibrated its understanding of what defense in the region and, and beyond actually refers to, right, then maybe you know it needs a rebranding to accommodate, right, or to sorry, not accommodate, accompany, 
accompany this new global role uh, you know that uh, you know it, it plays some say that okay maybe you know placing it un- direct, more directly under the auspices of the UN right would then you know uh, make it more palatable i think that's a good word to use also it's more palatable that means uh, you know the critics will be accepted will be accepting you know of the organization right so you know rather than to you know you know uh, you know just keep it as you know as it is right now what you want to do is make it more international in nature so rebrand it to be more international of course right then it can be problematic because if you're going to bring it under the auspices of the UN then that complicates the functioning you know if you're going to think about uh, you know making it similar to the UN and you know have a security council within it you know like an exclusive decision making body then you're opening up a can of worms because you go back to the idea of who now makes the decisions right because it's going to come under the auspices of the UN would you see the P5 then you know having playing uh, playing a larger role in the organization so of course you know this is something for you to remember maybe write write it down write this down Okay, for this topic or for any other topic also, right? You know, like for example, when we looked at the UN and we talked about uh, how, you know, there should be perhaps a, a, a reform of the UN Security Council, right? That is one common, uh, uh, you know, question or common angle that you can include in your evaluation. Two, this one, the rebranding of NATO. Three, EU also, right, with the problem children like Hungary and Poland, right, making a lot of problems about, you know, how should integration occur, right? So some of the angles, you know, towards your conclusion, right, would go towards making recommendations, right, like this, like what we're, what we're saying down here, right? How should it, you know, evolve from this point onwards? How should it rebrand or reposition itself, right? When you make these proposals, right, always make sure, do not pluck them out of the sky, Right, and just you know, have this random you know proposal that you are putting in number one. That means there must be some basis. So, now provided some idea. Yeah, okay, you know, maybe you know changing the name, right? Which is already suggested. Why? Because you know that's an anomaly there, right? So you know that's a basis for my suggestion for the suggestion of the proposal. That's number one. So there must be some kind of basis, some kind of maybe something that happened in the past, and you're basing it on that. First point. Second point. When you make proposals, right, or recommendations, always make sure that you acknowledge that there are limitations. So when you talked about, you know, uh, you know, reconfiguring this UN Security Council, what are the potential problems if you expand P5 to P10, right? If that's your suggestion, are there any potential problems that can arise out of it? So always point out, these are the loopholes. Don't let other people point out the loopholes in the suggestion or an argument that you make. You say, you know, what's that? This own self check, own self logic, right? You, so you say something, right? And then you say, okay, but actually there's a problem. I acknowledge it. That prevents the marker from saying it doesn't fit. Your argument is a failure, right? There's a loophole. I disagree with you. It's not feasible. You understand the rationale down here, right? Uh, so you know the the you you say it, right? And then you say, okay, this is a problem with it, right? Uh, but overall, I still think that this can be feasible if X Y Z is done, right? So this is how you structure the proposal. You understand? Or you always admit, you know, that there may be a a, a problem and so on. Okay, all right. This one, I'm not going to run through, all right? This one, you can read yourself, right? And watch, you know, any kind of video that, you know, is related to Trump's complaints and so on, right? Okay, uh, so you can take a look at that. You know, I've uh, just, you know, put in uh, some of the... Uh, please, please take a look at this one. The the disastrous, you know, NATO summit, you know, where Trudeau and a couple of others, you know, were, were making private jokes and they were laughing and so on, right? Uh, that's for your own entertainment, right? Okay, so I'm not going to run through that with you all. All right, so, you know, take a look at this one. Uh, this is the article I was referring to. This one, the NATO isn't what you think it is, right? Uh, I've uploaded this article for you in the eGlobal. Please go and take a look at that, okay? All right, this is the question, right? Is the data, it is from, yes, it's dated, right? But the number of times I've seen this question appear, Right, or a different iteration of this question, a version of this question. This was what I was telling you just now. All right, so if this is the, you know, if NATO was established to provide a Western response to Soviet intransigence, why didn't it disappear along with the ending of the Cold War? Typical realist uh, statement. Remember, like what we saw, like what Michaela pointed out, and then how he crafted the argument, right? Uh, so you can see, you can see, this is the typical angle of inquiry, right? But now that you've looked at all of the different, you know, uh, aspects and arguments you can include, easy to answer, straightforward, right? Actually, the question, there, there's nothing much they can hide 
with a topic like this, with this topic. You understand? That is why I say whether you know you are the you know the type that is inclined to write about security issues and so on, right? On war and conflict, this is still a very good, easy topic to rely on. Okay, so I I I I know people will start xing out topics for your revision towards mock exam and everything. I really don't recommend xing this out. Right, that's my opinion. Right, you know, do whatever you do, however you do it, you know, you are responsible for it. Right, you take your own risk. Right, I do not recommend taking a risk. Right, no, I will say I will say like that, but I also say like this. Right, okay, I'll flip flop on on this. Right, I know I say you can take a risk if you want, but I do not recommend you taking a risk. Stick, you know, look at this. I will upload the outline for you, right? Like as an addendum, like I usually do, right? Okay, very straightforward standard answer, easy to answer. Okay, all right. I will see you next week for OSCE. All right, okay. Uh, do me a favor before you come to that class, right? Uh, just have a quick run through of the Mekela reading, right? Because I'm going to make reference to the security community again in application. Okay, all right. See you all next week. Enjoy your week. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat> For once, I ended two minutes before time. Achievement, right? Achievement unlocked. Bye, bye, bye.